Good morning. Welcome, everyone. I'm Lynn Sainamore. I'm the chair of the Internet Governance Forum Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group. And we're expecting two um, guest speakers this morning, Hulin Zhao, the Secretary General of the International Telecommunications Union, and Michael Muller, who is the Director General of the United Nations Office of Geneva. They're both expected in um, here in the first hour. So in order to respect schedules, we're going to be a little bit flexible with the first hour in terms of our agenda approval and a couple of the presentations that are, that are scheduled. So this is the second phase of our second face-to-face -face meeting in our preparatory cycle for IGF 2017. And I'd like to thank everybody for participating um, in the work of the IGF to date, particularly all the workshop proposals and um, all the other contributions that have come in. That's from the broader community as well, of course, as recognizing all the work from the MAG and the Secretariat. Um, I'm going to do just a quick introduction at the moment. Again, we're waiting for the Secretary General of the ITU to come in and address us. But on my left is Thomas Schneider, who is the honorary host country chair, given Switzerland is hosting the IGF later this year. And since our last meeting, um, Thomas has um, been appointed as an ambassador. His official title is Director of International Relations for the Swiss Federal Office of Communications. And I think, again, we're very, very honored to have him here, um, not only because of his contacts and, and position here within the Swiss government, but he has been long, long, long involved in internet governance uh, discussions going back to WISIS, um, early, earliest WISIS days. So um, unless there's an update on the Secretary General's arrival, um. we'll just not yet, but I've uh, been told that his arrival is imminent. Okay. Um, maybe what I'll do is um, just say a couple more words about today, then pass to Changatai um, for some additional logistics um, uh, instructions here. But again, this is a day is the open consultation. The MAG members are in a listening mode. It really is the opportunity to hear from the community on any matters with respect to um, the effects the activities of the IGF forum. I will pass um, to Mr. Hulan Zhao as soon as he arrives here, and we will move back to the administrative logistics, et cetera, later. <laughs> so I was saying we're very honored to have um, who then here today. We are obviously in the premises of the ITU and they were actually very good to provide us with the space during what is a very busy period, um, certainly in Geneva, but in the ITU as well, given um, the World Summit and Information Society is actually occurring here this week. So with that, I'd like to welcome Hu Lin, and you have the floor. Oh, you did. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see you here. Uh, as you could understand, uh, today is a very busy day for me. Uh, we started our WISIS uh, week, and uh, I can tell you, I have uh, speeches today, eight speeches. Uh, and this is my first uh, formal speech, so I will not make um, any mistake to take a wrong <laughs> one here. But uh, anyhow, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to join your meeting under the kind uh, invitation from uh, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Ling Amu, and she's my friend for many, many years. And of course, uh, Ambassador Schneider is uh, also a very good friend. And uh, see uh, some of you quite familiar, and uh, quite a lot. I don't really get a chance to know. But uh, it's good to uh, come to join you for this uh, second uh, uh, MAC meeting, which is the preparatory meeting for this year's International Governance uh, Forum, IGF taking place here in Geneva in December. It has been a very exciting two weeks at ITU. And we have uh, the WISIS Forum week this week. And we have uh, another busy week last week, that is uh, AI for Good uh, Global Summit, organized by ITU and XPRIZE, along with uh, around 20 United Nations agencies and bodies as partners. We come together to discuss how much AI will improve our lives and how we can all work together to make AI a force.
for good, especially in relation to achieving the SDGs. Uh, that is not uh, just uh, some kind of uh, promotion materials, and I can tell you, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Mr. Uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, he himself personally engaged uh, with uh, such kind of uh, uh, studies, and he, uh, from the beginning of this year, he already asked me to provide him some briefings, and uh, he gave uh, good support to uh, frontier technologies such as uh, AI, and you know, we are very honored. Last week uh, we get uh, this uh, video message, and as I told the audience, at the from beginning of this year I tried to invite him to make uh, some kind of uh, video messages to our activities, including uh, our annual World Telecom Human Society Day celebration, uh, including today's wishes. But he did not uh, uh, make it, <coughs> and, but uh, he consider that the AI for good uh, summit is quite important for him to talk to the industry. So he particularly made that kind of uh, message. So that uh, uh, clearly has demonstrated uh, uh, his uh, uh, commitment uh, with SDGs uh, and with uh, frontier technologies. Uh, so we are very, very honored. So we also uh, recognizing the many challenges, of course, that uh, AI may bring with it. More than 500 speakers and participants come to our conference, including the top AI experts of the world. And I was told that more than 5,000 people live streaming the event online. So this event is a major milestone in our efforts to accelerate and advance the development and democratization of AI solutions that can address specific global challenges related to poverty, hunger, health, education, the environment, and many others. So the second event was also annual event of Internet of Things Week that is coincides with AI for Good Summit. That gathered more than 700 uh, IoT experts, researchers, and uh, industry leaders to discuss uh, the latest uh, technologies, uh, industry and uh, market evolution. A key theme was to review and address the potential of the IoTs to achieve 17 SDGs, including topics such as uh, water management, uh, smart cities, uh, industry, climate change, and uh, biodiversity. I'm happy that the IGF is also this year organized uh, in Geneva. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, we had our WISIS uh, summit uh, in December 2003, and then we had our second phase of WISIS uh, in November 2005, and the first IGF meeting was held uh, in Athens. I was there. Uh, but then we did not have chance to get IGF uh, back to Geneva. So this is the uh, first time IGF will come back to Geneva. I, I'm very pleased to see that uh, our Swiss authority seriously uh, promoted this event and uh, tried to have this event uh, as uh, somewhat different uh, from the others, but also as uh, uh, opportunities to, you know, to bring back uh, the experts uh, everywhere from the order to, to, to Geneva. You know. So this uh, WISIS forum and IGF, uh, these two forums, IGF, Internet Governance Forum, and the WISIS forum are two major forums as a result of WISIS. So we worked together uh, during the first 10 years from 2005 to 2015. And 2015 when we uh, had uh, the chance to get the uh, United Nations to review the process and uh, both uh, IGF and uh, WISIS forum uh, hand by hand and work with our members to invite the UN to give us uh, another uh, period of, uh, of uh, activities. And we are very pleased in, and the uh, uh, United Nations uh, valued our 10 experiences from 2005 to 2015 and then give us opportunity to continue for another 10 years. So that is, uh, uh, again, a uh, great uh, 
honor for us to, I mean, that, uh, to see this uh, with this forum, and uh, IGF uh, will continue for another 10 years. They have, of course, uh, uh, they have their own unique uh, rules, uh, different from each other, and they are key areas of focus and unique programs and audience. IGF being the forum for internal governance uh, uh, conventions and the WISIS forum being the place to have ICT for developmental related discussions. And for your information, I'm also very pleased uh, to uh, welcome the board of ICON uh, to have uh, you know, the meeting in our building at the beginning of this uh, year, actually at the beginning of uh, May. And I'm, I was very pleased to welcome the entire board of ICON together with their consultant to come to Geneva. And we had uh, almost uh, four hours meeting, including, of course, uh, lunch. And we had a very good uh, atmosphere you know, to look for the future, to work together. So uh, this WISIS forum, you know, I'll just uh, take this opportunity to uh, promote our uh, with the forum a little bit, attract more than 2,500 participants uh, announced, which include uh, about 150 ICT ministers and high-ranking officials, such as the head of uh, uh, their regulatory agencies, and also uh, close to 200 uh, sessions, including high-level dialogues and uh, workshops. They also include uh, uh, Hectones organized by IEEE, a special virtual reality track, and uh, text talks, among several other exciting new features. TEDx uh, talks we will start this afternoon. The underlying theme of the WISIS forum is, of course, uh, facilitating the implementation of the WISIS uh, action lines for advising sustainable development. I invite you all to immerse yourself in the conversations happening around you and enjoy WISIS Forum 2017. As a strong supporter of the IGF, ITU is very excited about this year's IGF and is planning to organize or co-organize open forums and other events on key initiatives. ITU and other partners are working on this preparations. We will also host the fourth annual Gem Tech Awards, jointly organized by ITU and UN Women at IGF. You can count on ITU in your efforts to make IGF 2017 a real success. So I was invited by IGF, also invited by a Swiss authority, to, and also by, by, by you, <laughs> Dr. Amo that uh, uh, I will come to join IGF uh, 2017. I missed uh, IGF last year because uh, we had, uh, unfortunately, overlapping IT activities. Uh, and uh, also 2015 in uh, Brazil, I missed them again. That is our WRC 15, so I cannot leave Geneva. Uh, but uh, this year, I will be very pleased to join IGF. And I, in the past, uh, I joined, as I told you, I joined the first IGF in Athens, and then the ninth IGF in Istanbul, 2014. So I'm uh, very excited to come back to join you uh, here uh, in de December, uh, IGF 2017. So Dr. Ling, I think that uh, I better to stop here. And uh, once more again, uh, on behalf of ITU, we welcome you and uh, your MAC meetings in Geneva, in ITU. And uh, if there's anything we can do, and please uh, just let us know. We will try to help to make your meetings, and make your stay with uh, with this uh, pleasant uh, experience. And uh, look forward to see you at your IGF meeting later this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hulen. Um, very much appreciate your making time to be here in what is clearly a, a busy schedule. And um, you offered another benefit for meeting so late in December, and that was the availability, hopefully, of many <laughs> ministers, governments, and um, heads of UN and intergovernmental organizations to, um, to join us here. 
as it seems, the uh, UN and international meeting calendar is not quite so full at that, uh, mm. at that time. Thank you, and best of luck with uh, the rest of your day and the rest of the week. Yeah, if you allow me, I have to leave. I have uh, yes, to yes. give another <laughs> <laughs> opening remarks somewhere. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we have roughly 20, 25 minutes, I think, before uh, Mr. Mueller comes in. Um, what I'd like to do is to pass to Changatai, who will um, cover a few of the administrative um, uh, aspects here of the meeting. We have tried to make some progress with respect to more seamlessly um, integrating the online participants with the participants here in the room. And the Secretary has worked quite hard to pull together a system that facilitates that. And Changatai is going to walk us through that and perhaps a few other administrative logistics. And then we'll move to the host country presentation. Changatai, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just be uh, short and brief, just a couple of reminders. Um, when, it, when we get to the main body of the meeting, when you're making um, interventions, uh, please state your name and um, <clears throat> Uh, just for the record so that the transcribers can um, note your name. And if you can also speak slowly when you say your name, because I know we're all very used to saying our names and we say it very fast and the organization as well. If we can just do that half a bit slower than we usually speak, then that will be great for the um, transcribers. Now, as Lynn mentioned, um, we do have a new floor request system. Uh, this was just as a response uh, to the fact that um, many people do request the floor at the same time, and it's sometimes difficult for us here at the top to see who's requesting and, and which order that the people requested the floor, and also to give um, to uh, equal the playing field a bit to the people um, who are remotely um, participating. Now, it's an online uh, floor request system. If you go to the uh, front page and um, where the information, right at the bottom of the page, where we have um, the information about the second open consultations and MAG meeting, um, there's a little tab there that says floor request. Um, there's instructions there and then access the floor system. Now, in order to access this floor system, you have to have registered at the IGF um, website. If you have not registered, you can always register now, and somebody, it will take about five minutes for somebody here to um, approve uh, your registration. Uh, there's also some um, notes at the back there, which Eleonora can distribute if you want the notes. So you, you, you put in your name. And um, the field should be already uh, pop populated for you, and then you request. It's very self-explanatory. We don't have to really um, ex explain it that much. Just g get into it. You'll see where the, your, your, your name is, and then you just put it in, and then um, click the hand up button. And if you want to remove your name as well, just click the button to remove your name, and your name will be removed. Uh, this is the first time we've tried it, so if um, there might be a, little f a, a few glitches, but we'll try and improve it. But I think it's going to be a good system, and it will enable everybody to see where they are in the queue, because sometimes you know you put your name and your number 17 on the system, and it takes you an hour. We have not for for forgotten you, so you know exactly where you, where you are on the system. And we will remove you once you have um, done your intervention. Also, uh, tomorrow during lunch, we are going to have just an update on the um, IGF Trust Fund. It will be here in this room uh, during lunchtime. And we'll try and give you, depending on how long it will go, of course, we'll, we'll, we are going to try and give you some um, space to get your lunch as well. Um, so if you're interested in um, a presentation on the, um, IG just an update on the IGF Trust Fund, uh, please be here in this room tomorrow um, lunchtime. Thank you, Thank you Changatai. Uh, just one quick question. Is there a backup mechanism for somebody to request help, either online or in the room, if they have an, an issue? I mean, I, I, I could suggest it here in the room. You could. 
Luis Bobo. Uh, Luis is right there at the it's corner there. there. So if you if a... have an issue, you can put your hand up and we'll tell him to go to you. And if you're, if you're um, in the, um, sorry, it's not Webex, I always want to say Webex, Webex, but we're using Adobe Connect uh, this time around. If you're in Adobe Connect, you can just send a message within Adobe Connect and Lewis will be able to um, assist you. Thank you. And so that Lewis isn't overwhelmed. Lewis also has other responsibilities here in the meeting with respect to uh, the uh, AV um, and online support, so he will, he will get to everybody just as quickly as, as, um, as he can. So with that, um, I'd like to move to the first item, which is approval of the agenda. The agenda has been posted online for some weeks. The MAG has discussed it on the last two um, MAG calls. So at this point, I would like to see if there are any further comments or questions before requesting your approval. Seeing none, we'll call the agenda approved. And again, remind everybody that this is the open consultation. Um, priority will be given to um, the community. MAG members are asked to be in a listening mode um, for the day and really sort of strongly request that um, we take the floor an absolute minimum um, possible to ensure that we give the community the maximum time to, to participate. Um, with that, I'll turn to Thomas, who will um, walk us through a host country presentation. And again, we're still in this slightly flexible mode while we wait for the uh, Director General for the United Nations Office at Geneva to come. So, Thomas, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Lynn, and good morning, everybody. Welcome back in Geneva. Uh, please remember when you come back in December that it can actually be very nice and warm uh, in Geneva. So I hope you have your bathing suits with you because the lake has a nice temperature, even at night times. Um, so um, just to make that very clear. Um, <laughs> um, we have been, of course, uh, a little active since uh, March, our, our last uh, when we met for the last time both on, on logistical level and also on, on trying to, to uh, use the momentum and engage with as many people uh, and institutions as we could um, to uh, inform them about the IGF, those who did not know what that is, about explaining them what that is, why we believe that this is a unique opportunity um, for everybody to get together. Um, we just had the European IGF, the Eurodig, last week in, in Tallinn where, of course, as well, uh, lots of references were made to the, to the global IGF here, here in, in Geneva. That will be in December. Um, and uh, the Swiss government has uh, reached out uh, to a number of uh, IGOs here in Geneva um, to, to also meet with them and, and uh, see wh how they could uh, get engaged if they aren't already engaged uh, in the in the uh, in the IGF process, and uh, we have uh, uh, the feedback was very uh, uh, interested and and interesting. So we'll we'll continue to 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 meet with with uh, institutions here in Geneva, and we'll also of course everywhere we go in every institution that we are representing Switzerland, uh, we are referring to the IGF. We are using all the bilaterals that our president has. Uh, to talk about the IGF and explain why we think that also uh, high-level uh, government representatives and others uh, should be there. Um, we uh, are uh, also working on, on uh, supporting uh, intergovernmental institutions to, to work on open fora um, that, um, that they could use to, to share experience and reach out to others. We do also, of course, hope that some of the uh, proposals that have been made by governments, which there aren't too many, uh, will make it into the final workshop uh, spaces because, as we all know, um, it is not trivial to explain to governments that are used to going to conferences where texts are adopted or, or 
so-called decisions are made um, that they should be here uh, at the IGF and discuss with all stakeholders. And I think uh, uh, we should really support those governments who are engaged and active and have made proposals and see that um, we can have uh, at least some of them uh, in, in the uh, see them in, in the final workshops. Also think about uh, government engagement when we uh, discuss the main sessions and, and other spaces. Um, so this is of course something that, that we are also trying to explain to everybody that these different formats are all different opportunities with different settings and, and, and different objectives to some extent. And, and that uh, uh, governments and intergovernmental institutions should uh, not wait for everybody else to, to, to fill up the spaces, but actually get active themselves. And I think we should uh, uh, support those who, who have taken the, the, the energy and resources to, to try and come up with something. Um, that's just a side remark. I guess we'll get to that later in, in uh, uh, today's discussions and, of course, as well uh, tomorrow and, and the days after. Um, so, um, as yes, he's coming up. This is a very good coordination with no words, <laughs> not even looking at each other. He knows that it's his, uh, his show now because, of course, we have also been working a little bit on the logistics and we have managed to set up a website, um, the host country website that um, uh, our team has, has set up and worked with, with a number of people. Uh, in an excellent cooperation in the past few few weeks. And uh, this is what you will see. And Jorge, um, our colleague, will, will uh, run you quickly through this um, until uh, the Director General of uh, UNIC will come. So um, let's wait for a second <clears throat> until this is on the screen. And of course, um, we'll also, I've just been contacted by Segun. Um, who is part of the working group on communication. Uh, I think outreach and contacting people, every, everyone in, in every part of his or her network is key to, to, to bringing people together. Some, it is really not obvious for many who are not so close or not so familiar with the IGF process that people do understand the unique opportunity of, of uh, the IGF and also the particularly unique opportunity of coming to the IGF in wintertime in, in to Geneva. And uh, we are hap very happy to, to cooperate with everybody who is uh, willing and engaged to, to also communicate and, and, and so to unite and keep each other informed, do follow-ups if necessary uh, with official um, with officials that would need uh, or would benefit from, from being contacted by, by the host country. Of course, we are very happy to do everything we can to support you all in uh, outreach and communication exercises. Um, so just come to us uh, whenever you have something that you would like to share with us. With this, I'd like to, to stop here for the time being um, and hand over to Jorge, who will quickly run you through the website. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning. I think that only one side of the room has a, a direct view of the website, but the, the other side, I guess, uh, Luis is, is working very hard on, on it. Um, as to the website, the, the best thing I can tell you is just to, to visit it, to, to be one of the, the first people to, to go through it and also to to give us feedback if you see any anything which is not uh, clear, which is not uh, uh, evident, or if you see any glitches that uh, that m might well be. Uh, this is uh, really the, the premiere of, of the website. As to the contents, it's uh, a very similar to, to the websites of uh, previous uh, uh, years. We have uh, some general information about the IGF 2017, what the IGF is about. Um, uh, mention that we are in a new um, phase after the um, 
extension of the mandate of the IGF in 2015. And of course, uh, there's a, a link to the general invitation by the Under Secretary General of uh, UNDESA, which was uh, uh, published last week, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, then we have um, oops, some uh, general information about the, about the venue. The Palais des Nations, which is uh, known to, to most of you, I guess. Um, uh, some of the facilities inside the Palais des Nations. Uh, also the, for cafe, cafes and restaurants. The local transport, how it is organized here in, in Geneva, which you will know also. And uh, registration and badging, which will be forthcoming as soon as the IGF Secretariat publishes the, the registration for 2000 for the IGF. We will do the same, of course. And some useful information about Geneva, climate, <coughs> visa information, of course, which is uh, always very important to, to have uh, well in advance. And some information on how to get to, to Geneva, the accommodation, and where the uh, Palais des Nations is located within Geneva, uh, within, the, within the map. So I will leave it by that and return to the picture we've included where we see the, the Lake of Geneva and the, the Palais de, <coughs> des Nations. It wasn't so easy to, to get such a picture where you where you see all, all these elements, but we, we found one which is uh, quite appealing, I think. So uh, I'll leave it by this and uh, be happy to, to answer any questions if uh, there are any. I guess this is a moment to ask some questions or make some remarks. Yes, Brazil. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a question of uh, the indexation here. I was looking on Google, etc. Uh, IGF 2017 official website, etc., etc. Couldn't find it. So it, perhaps it would be a good idea to work on that, just to make it easier to to find it when you're looking for it. Because if you don't that, if you don't know where where, where it is, you, it's very difficult to find out. I don't know what you can do about that, but it's just a uh, Suggestion. Thank you. Well, it's 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 very new. Maybe maybe Google doesn't know it yet, but they will find it uh, rather soon. And uh, if not, we'll we'll try and tell Google that they should. Uh, but of course, they don't manipulate their algorithms. But sometimes, uh, suddenly, things appear that don't appear before. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Christian, you have the floor, and you broke the ground with a new cue. Thank you. That was actually my goal today. Um, no, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the website, and I fully agree, that is an awesome picture. It's really very nice. Um, I would have just one observation, myself as a user, when I, and I do look at a lot of conference websites for all the things that I cover, and one of the things that annoying me to, to no end is the fact that I actually have to search for the dates. So if it was possible to have IGF Geneva 2017 and then December, blah, 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 right in that main page rather than in the body of the text, certainly uh, for me as a user, and I know that I'm not alone in this, it would be very nice. I know it's right there in the beginning of the text, but already I need my glasses to put it on. So, um, so that would be my recommendation. But so far, it looks very nice, and congratulations. Thank you. That's, that's a very good point, and uh, we'll take it into account. <laughs> And by December, the dates will be on, of course, uh, uh, very prominently. Um, thank you. Other remarks? I don't see anybody else in the queue. We have roughly seven or eight minutes prior to the Director General coming. 
Is there anything else you want to cover at this point in time, Thomas, with respect to host country preparations or? I mean, if not, we'll. Um, maybe just, just a, a, a piece of information that there will be a, a session about the IGF at the WISIS forum. By the way, I'll be, we'll be running back and forth a little bit because uh, I also have some, some, some uh, participations. I will participate in some of the events at the WISIS forum. But on Thursday, I think it's from 1315 to 1400, there's a session uh, about the IGF. Maybe there will be uh, others, but so. This goes uh, more or less hand in hand, and uh, yeah, do look out for um, um, these these uh, uh, events. And of course, use also talking about communication. Use the fact that we are here together with uh, a large number of people that participate at the WISIS forum to talk to everybody about the IGF and its, its uh, uniqueness and so on and so forth, because uh, this is like free a free meeting point for one week uh, with with a very large number of people that will probably be very interested. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it can be very simple. You must be at the IGF in Geneva. That's where everything important to the internet and its governance happens. We are welcoming Michael Mueller. You know, this is Switzerland. Everything is working like clockwork. <laughs> so again, we're very, very um, happy to welcome Michael Mueller here, the Director General of the United Nations Office in Geneva. The IGF, of course, will be taking place in the Palais des Nations, just across the road, virtually. And um, we're very honored, again, to be here and to have your remarks. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to Geneva for the multi-stakeholder advisory group meeting of the Internet Governance Forum. It's a pleasure because this gathering is part of a global effort to nurture a precious global resource, the Internet. And I would like to thank the ITU for hosting this important event and the forum for the chance to speak with you today. The Internet is fundamental to the great issues of our time. Like the printing press or mass communication, it unleashed revolutions in thought and breakthroughs in every field, including in sustainable development. The Internet and the proliferation of ever cheaper smartphones have made it possible through e-health, microfinance and data collection services, among so many other others, to jumpstart development. And the Internet will only grow more vital as emerging technology like the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and autonomous vehicles enter our lives. The success of the Internet is in large part due to the way it was built and allowed to grow as an open, bottom-up platform for innovation, one that allows visionary ideas to blossom into global titans like Alibaba and Google. This openness is both the Internet's greatest asset and its greatest vulnerability. And today, no one is safely out of reach of hackers, while terrorists sell, spread hate, and find recruits online. Unsubstantiated news stories flourish, and organized crime syndicates continue to exploit it. The paradigm is that tackling these issues without the necessary care could undermine the very openness of the Internet, while a failure to act together could lead to an overcorrection on the parts of states, fracturing the global Internet into narrow national networks. Ultimately, we need a global governance of the Internet, but one in which the interest of all stakeholders, states, and the wider Internet community are represented. This is why the multi-stakeholder model at the heart of the Internet Governance Forum is so essential. This bottom-up approach is best suited to foster free discussion on the shared principles, norms, and rules that will shape the Internet as we move along. This model is also essential in light of today's global trust deficit with public opinion distrustful of institutions at every level. A January 2017 Pew Research poll found that a majority of Americans did not trust their government or social media sites to protect their data, but did trust credit card firms and mobile phone providers. 
1864, the international community came to Geneva to set the rules in that era's premier arena of competition, the battlefield. Today, the Internet is an arena both for competition and for cooperation between states, the private sector, and civil society. Geneva, however, remains the logical place for the international community to come together and write the rules for this arena. And Geneva is home to many relevant actors like the, IG the ITU, the IGF, and CERN. But Geneva is also a natural home for multi-stakeholder approaches. That is because it's a veritable laboratory where the proximity of actors fosters collaboration, deep institutional knowledge is shared, and parties are willing to experiment, to sometimes fail, but ultimately to make breakthroughs. Just two examples of what International Geneva is all about. Last month, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and Microsoft launched a new initiative to use the big data revolution to help detect human rights crisis, while the Geneva University and Tsinghua University uh, launched a new master's degree in innovation and sustainability. Students with this program will work with the United Nations Systems Entities and CERN to develop groundbreaking solutions to contemporary problems. I very much look forward to the 12th annual meeting of the Internet Governance Forum, which, as you know, will take place here in Geneva in December. Events like it demonstrate how international Geneva is rich and fertile soil for collaboration and how much it can constructively contribute to tackling the challenges of today. The world is going through transformation of a magnitude that we have yet to fully grasp. Fast technological progress challenges us all to rethink and reimagine the way we work and collaborate. And let me wish you all the success as you work collectively to protect and nurture the internet for future generations. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you, Mr. Muller. Again, we appreciate your taking the time. I know this is also a very busy week for you, and um, we're all very much looking forward to being in the Palais in, uh, in December. I believe I'm correct. You can stay with us for a little bit, or? Yeah. Then um, we'll move to item six on the agenda, which is a briefing from the Secretariat on um, sort of the state of preparations. We are in the midst of the workshop selection process and um, so we're about halfway through finalizing the program for the IGF. So I will turn to Chengatai. Chengatai, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Lynn. Yes, um, as the Chair has said, uh, we have finished the, um, the first two parts of the workshop selection process. Um, the d deadline for the MAG to evaluate the uh, workshops was on the 29th of May. Yes, 29th of May. And um, so the uh, MAG evaluated all the workshops. There were 268 workshops that we received. Um, f from that um, evaluation, uh, we have done a ranking of the workshops. Now, the Secretariat um, estimates that we should have only about uh, space for 80 workshops, and we have to select uh, those 80 workshops from the 268 that um, passed the initial submission. There were some workshops that were disqualified because they didn't meet the minimum requirements, such as for the panelists or for the regional distribution, etc. Uh, now, the stage is now set for tomorrow, where the MAG is going to meet and uh, make the final selection um, of those workshops um, to make it until 80. Uh, the plan is, when we, we are not going to, um, the MAG um, has made the discussions and there are some workshops that are going to be chosen um, due to be for, I'm sorry, um, based not just based on merit, that, that means not based on um, the score that they received, but also because they're interesting or because they may have been lacking in one or two aspects that can be improved and to also enrich the um, IGF uh, meeting that we're going to have in December. So it's not just based on the score. Also, we have the open um, forums and the um, dynamic coalitions, etc., which we have a deadline for the 21st of June for people to make 
um, there's some request for space at the uh, IGF meeting. Now, this year, uh, we reduced slightly the number of workshops that we're going to have because we want to make more space to encourage governments and also International Geneva and the IGOs to come in. And this year, we plan to have more open forums and to have certain tracks on um, certain aspects of uh, International Geneva. For, for instance, uh, we plan to have a humanitarian track where people like the WHO, uh, uh, etc., uh, the UNHCR can have a open forum to show aspects dealing with internet governance that they deal with. You know, there's all, always big data, there's you know, the integrity of the data, there's privacy, security. All these organizations here do deal with these aspects of internet governance. I, mean, I, I don't think there is any organization that um, does not deal with some aspect or is not affected with some aspect of um, internet governance in their day-to-day -day -day working. Uh, we've also met, as uh, Thomas has said, uh, the Swiss ambassador has been um, very active in getting International Geneva together and um, with organizations such as CERN, you know, where you know that uh, the World Wide Web uh, started from, uh, to come in and also do some sort of activity within um, the IGF meeting. So those discussions are ongoing, and we do plan to have a much richer uh, program this year than we've had in previous years to make this IGF the best ever, as it was uh, last year. Um, we still have the um, open forums, as I, I mean, the best practice forums, which we are working on, uh, which the, we, we are going to have presentations on those uh, during the course of today. So I will not go uh, very much into them. Um, the other thing I can say is um, we are going to start registration. I think we're going to start it probably beginning of July. Uh, one of the problems with uh, registration is, of course, uh, when you get visas, they're only valid for the first three months. You can't have a visa six months in advance. It's usually three months in advance. So we have to be careful. But also, it's also useful for people to be able to um, time when they're going to go to the uh, Swiss mission or embassy in their country to, to, to get their visas, because many in this community do travel. And as you know, Switzerland holds meetings all the time at the United Nations. So there is no worry, as we've had in previous years, that the, um, the, the, the missions or the embassies will not be aware of um, the meeting. Um, the the com communications with the Swiss is, you know, is excellent. I mean, it's second to none. So I don't think we'll have any problems with that. But if there are any problems, they're free to um, contact the Secretariat. And the Swiss will, will also have a contact person um, for those issues. I think that's all for the update um, from my side. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when, over the course of the day, would you like to just present the statistics for the overall workshops and profile? Oh, yes. Um, I can present, well, I can present it now if you want, or I was thinking of doing those deeper statistics tomorrow as we go into the, uh, yeah. I mean, I actually think it's of interest to the community. We have a, a profile that simply shows of the workshops that have been preliminarily selected through the results of the MAG evaluation to date, but of course not yet with the benefit of two days of MAG discussion. Um, how that profile actually compares to the total set of workshops that was submitted, and we actually have a, a view of that based on various diversity characteristics, so region, stakeholder, developer versus developing country, first-time proposer versus returning proposer, um, tags or topics. And I mean, I, I personally think that's useful information. It is posted on the website. Um, I can leave it to people here if you think that's of interest. I think the Secretariat is prepared to share that information. If you'd like to go into um, the specific reviews, then. Oh, I mean, we can do it now. I, I thought it would be a good start for tomorrow, but we can do it now. That's fine. Uh -huh. 
Thank you. I want to just thank um, Mr. Michael Mueller again mm -hmm. for joining us and in advance for his hospitality. <laughs> For, for us, in advance for his hospitality later in the year. Thank you. People sort of interested in seeing those high level statistics or I see heads nodding around the room. Apologies to those that are participating online. I can't see your heads. Um, if there's any strong objection, people can come into the, the speaking queue. And in fact, I have Marilyn Cade in the speaking queue. Marilyn, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. My name is Marilyn Cade. Let me offer my greetings and welcome to other colleagues who are attending the open consultation. I want to particularly reinforce the importance, as a former MAG member, that of uh, the importance of the MAG listening to the community and also note that I did make a comment last week that this agenda today is very packed with communications and briefings, and I think it's uh, a little bit more challenging for remote participants than perhaps those of us who are here present understand to be able to um, uh, make their comments. I have, um, for instance, timed the amount of time, and I think this new system, and I want to congratulate Lewis in particular, is uh, really great, but it did take me 20 to 30 seconds to uh, actually get my name, uh, to get online so that I could submit my name. So I just offer that as something, please, for all of us to remember. If people remotely are trying to sign up to make comments, the system great improvement over the past, but we need to be aware that it, there may be a little bit of a delay in people being able to sign up. That's not really the reason I took the floor. I am, um, I'm going to express both my congratulations to our country host, Switzerland, for their effort to make this a unique um, um, IGF and to take advantage of the fact we are in Geneva. Although I don't live in Geneva, I often think that I live on united.com in order to travel to Geneva. But most of the world does not come to Geneva frequently. And so there's a, a really interesting opportunity to take advantage of the um, engagement of the IGOs here and the rest of the UN system. However, I am going to make a comment that it's really important not to end up in a situation where the IGOs are talking to each other and the rest of the world is not able to justify traveling and attending the IGF. So let me just say that in the spirit of the following. Limiting the number of uh, workshops, which the MAG is considering doing, Reducing it is something that is going to be very challenging for um, participants to be able to justify getting travel funding. There's a lot of workshops that propose to be 90 minutes that perhaps could be reduced to 60 minutes or 75 minutes in order to regain a few slots. And there also are some mergers that could take place because for most of the world, not big corporations, that's not who I speak for, and perhaps not governments, but unless they have a speaking slot, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to get funding. And in order for us to take advantage of the IGO's uh, unique uh, contribution, it's really important to have a very diverse audience coming in person, not just listening remotely. So that's my primary message. I do have later comments to make about other work of the MAG, but I think the, this comment in particular, um, I was asked by a number of parties who were not able to travel to Geneva to note they would love to travel to Geneva, but if the number of workshops is substantially reduced, this may affect their ability to justify funding and to attend. And again, my congratulations to the host country for the uh, effort they are making to make this a truly unique um, IGF. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Marilyn. And I tend to count to six before calling a, 
um, an item closed, I guess I'm going to have to count to 30 if, in fact, there's a 20 to 30 second um, delay in the, um, but we will, we will be conscious of that when we actually open the floor for mics to ensure that people do have time to, um, to respond and get in the queue. And also with respect to your point, um, it was noted on a mail you sent to the MAG list um, that it's important to ensure that there's actually time for engagement um, in the, the session here. So we did discuss that on the last MAG call, and we're certainly asking presenters to keep their introductory and initial comments short, um, thereby allowing as much time for engagement as, as possible. So again, that's another thing we're, we're conscious of. Um, I think your, your comment about workshops um, versus open forums um, is important. I'm not sure I see a great difference between an open forum and a workshop in that many of those topics are just as interesting and just as informative to a large part of the community as well. But I think they are derived at differently in terms of making up the program, and I think these are some of the things we can pay attention to this year, irrespective of what our, our you know, split is um, in the program and then um, work into one of the um, working group activities next year as well so that we, we continue to um, improve and meet the full community's needs as we actually develop the, the program. So with that, um, the queue, speaking queue is empty. I will go back to Changatai to walk us through briefly um, just the high-level evaluation, sort of statistical um, synthesis of the proposals. Changatai? Uh, thank you very much, then. Uh, the Secretariat uh, produced uh, this um, PowerPoint presentation uh, for the MAG um, on the statistics, and I'd like to thank everybody, um, Eleonora, Lewis, and um, Anya. Uh, we all worked on it, so that's good. Um, so as I was saying um, before, that um, we do envision about 80 workshops uh, to go in, um, in initially. That, that doesn't mean that that's going to be the maximum. Um, after this, we may have a few more coming in just depending on um, what we get in for dynamic coalitions, um, hot topics, you know, space for hot topics, and the um, open forums. But we do think that all this is very important to make sure that um, all the stakeholders feel that uh, they are involved. Uh, we have, uh, as, as you'll see as I go on, I mean, governments have, gr have a little bit of difficulty organizing workshops per se, but that doesn't mean that they are not involved in internet governance matters, and, or, and it does not mean that they don't have anything to discuss or to showcase. So um, this is part of the reason why we're just making these um, adjustments. Now, um, on slide number three, what the secretary did was that we made the uh, we made a cutoff on the top seventy two and I think the uh, mark was uh, four point zero four and these are just the um, uh, tags of the top graded uh, proposals the thematic tags that were used. Uh, um, so the first tag was cybersecurity, gender issues, artificial intelligence, etc. cetera. Um, those are the tags as you go down. But if we go down to, sorry, let me. Uh, slide number six, uh, the thematic tags, overall use. Uh, then you can see what the community as a whole, those people who made proposals as a whole, not just the top 72, uh, made with, with their tags. And these are all the tags, not just first choice, second choice, or third choice. Um, the top tag was human rights online and going down. And the ones in red are the new tags, so the digital future, um, artificial intelligence, etc. Mm. Now, um, We've also found out that, yes, we could uh, merge a few of these tags, but it really won't make that much difference um, in the tags. Oh, and sorry, I was supposed to say number 10. So, number 10, yes, that is the comparative view of all the proposals, not just the top 72. So we call this as an indicator of what the community is interested in, what the topics the community is interested in. So the top 
is human rights for the top 72, and for all proposals, it's human rights online, so it's still uh, human rights. And as we go down, uh, the third tag, which is digital future, which is um, in line with our um, theme for this year, uh, so that's very good. And then the fourth tag is uh, the SDGs, the S Sustainable Development Goals. So we use this as just an indicator of what the community is really interested in. Now, if we go to slide number 11, we can see uh, the comparative view between the stakeholders. As usual with all IGFs, um, civil society did submit the most proposals, which was um, this year it was 65%. Um, they submitted 63% of the uh, civil society proposals uh, make up the uh, top 72. So it is fairly analogous, fairly the same. Um, intergovernmental organizations as well as we've got 10 and we've got 13 for the top 72. Now, the thing to note is that uh, governments made up 4% of the overall proposals. In the top 72, they're not shown. So that's um, one thing that the, the, the MAG is looking at as well. And, and that is also one of the reasons why we decided to increase the open forum space a, a little bit this year. This year. Now, um, it's still goes the same with the uh, different stakeholder groups. Uh, WIOG, as always, has um, the most. Uh, they made slight gains in the top 72. They did 49% um, in the top 72 versus 46% overall. Um, Eastern Europe is 3% which I find is, if you look at the population figures and the number of people who are actually active, Eastern Europe has got the smallest population. Um, Latin America made 23%, uh, and, and in fact, they are almost, I think, double or two and a half times if you would look at the population they um, represent. So that's a very good showing um, from Latin America. Um, and Asia Pacific is 20% um, overall versus 18% here. So uh, they do show, but of course, um, they do. They are the majority of the internet users on this planet is um, from the Asia Pacific region. Uh, next slide is um, number 12. As we can see from developed country and developing country overall. It's fairly the same, so there's no real worry there. And first time uh, versus returning, we've got uh, a huge portion, 35% um, first timers making up the top 72. Uh, so I think those are very good uh, statistics, and it shows that there is continuing interest in the IGF that we have new proposals uh, coming in. And the Bottom line is just um, the type of sessions, round table, panel, breakout group sessions, birds of a feather, etc. And these are the statistics that um, make it up. Now, this year, as I said, we had, we made an initial suggestion of the top 72 with a cutoff line, or with a cutoff line there, and then the MAG members were asked to put in some wild cards. Um, so MAG members suggested some workshops that they, with a few changes, deserved to be in the um, schedule for the IGF meeting. So those are the ones that we had here. We had four initial suggestions, and I think some more did come in. So we are going to take a look at those tomorrow. That will be part of the business for tomorrow. And the other thing of interest is, if we go to slide number 16, is that um, a couple of years ago, there was a suggestion made by um, 
Mike Nelson, uh, just to give him credit because he's the one who brought it up and we all thought that it was a very good idea, is to also look at the variance of the score, to look at um, which workshops MAG members disagreed on whether they were good or bad workshops. So we looked at the variance. So those ones with large variance means that they are a bit controversial topics. And these are worth looking deeper into to see, to see whether or not they are worth adding to the schedule because that shows that uh, there's not that great convergence of um, of ideas that this is a good workshop or this is a good topic or not. So um, we, the Secretariat made a list of uh, the top 10 with the highest variance, which um, the MAG members were asked to look at as well for, to, to include one or two of these uh, possible workshops in the schedule. Um, so those are the statistics. Uh, they're just used to help with the decision-making process. And if you have any questions, uh, we're here to answer them. Thank you, Changatai. Um, we have two speakers in the queue, Marilyn Cade and then Jim Prendergast. So we'll go to Marilyn first. Marilyn, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. My name is Marilyn Cade. Let me uh, commend the Secretariat and also the MAG for this work. But I do have a couple of um, questions, and um, I just seek clarification on this. I have, um, of course, as a former MAG member, closely followed the work of this year's MAG. And I did see this comment that governments did not submit workshops, but I don't know to what extent you've been able to actually, pardon me for using the term, data mine or analyze the workshop proposals for their inclusion of government as speakers. I can't speak to the top 72. I did read about 170 of the workshop proposals. And I note that many of the workshop proposals, I don't know how many are in the top 72, did include government um, as speakers. Many of them included governments as speakers. I understand uh, the issue of government. Uh, there seems to be now this idea that governments should be proposing workshops. Um, but I think it's really important to understand which workshops include government representatives as speakers. Um, governments do have the option of proposing an open forum. Um, I think that's also fairly difficult for some governments to um, do in a way that is broadly inclusive of all stakeholders. So perhaps I would just ask that the MAG take another look, um, not only at your preferred list of 72, but to broaden it out and make sure that the workshops you're looking at uh, are inclusive at least a third of them of governments as speakers. Then the second comment I have is, I see that one of the preferred models is roundtables. There's also an interest in breakout sessions. As someone who is not as familiar, perhaps, as the Swiss government or the IGF secretariat with the venue at the Palais, I think there's some challenges in actually really having roundtables and also in accommodating uh, breakout sessions. So I'm hoping that that's going to be a topic of practical discussion so that workshop proposers would be able to adjust what they can really do in the rooms that are available to them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. I just have a few quick responses. Um, for the uh, governments, yes. Um, as you've noted, and this is one of the things that we thought we, ha we, sh we, we should have thought of it, but we didn't think of it until we were looking at the statistics. Um, but yes, uh, for the next time round, um, we are going to make it automatic that um, we get a, uh, we, it's easy to extract how many of each stakeholder group are panelists in the workshops. 
Um, I've already asked uh, Lewis to work on it for the next time this year. It's a little bit difficult. I don't think he'll be able to do it um, uh, by tomorrow, but uh, we, 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 we had looked at it um, last week. And, but also, as, as you've said, you know, as you look at the workshops, you can also just uh, glance at the speakers list to see how many governments, if governments are represented on that uh, workshop. And he, he, yes, as well, um, it is important to, is, being a panelist on a workshop is one thing, but actually formulating a topic and um, putting it out there for discussion is quite another, and we are trying to encourage the latter. It's very difficult for governments, especially if people are from missions here, uh, some missions are very s small, and they have so many things that they want to do. And we do have a lot of people who are interested in internet governance, but the, just the time that it takes is, um, is quite a lot. So we, we are working on that, and the open forums is one way that uh, governments can uh, participate as well. Um, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Changatai. Jim, you have the floor. Sure. Thank you, uh, Chair. My name is Jim Prendergast with the Galway Strategy Group. Um, I would just echo something that Marilyn finished off with, with the um, configuration of the rooms. I do, I do realize we're, most of those rooms look similar to this, and I know that is the challenge of the venue, as is the limited number of space leading to a, a maximum of 80 workshops. So it may not be particularly relevant for this IGF, but as we do move into the scheduling component of the workshops that are accepted, those that do emphasize high participation, as I would call it, or high interactive uh, sessions, if there's a way to make those, uh, put those into rooms that do offer some more flexibility. Otherwise, some people may get in the business of rearranging the furniture, and I'm sure that won't go over very well. Um, another point, you know, a fantastic amount of analysis and data here that uh, I've only just begun to go through, so it's very interesting. Just a couple of questions on it. Um, when you identify a workshop submission as coming from an IGO or civil society or private sector, how do you handle situations where there's co-proposers, where there's a representative from two stakeholder groups? Is it only counted for one, or are both stakeholder groups included as part of those statistics? And then the only other question, and I don't want to say I'll take issue with it, but um, the tags across all of the workshop submissions, I would be careful to say that those represent what the community is interested in, because it really only represents what those who have submitted workshop proposals are interested in. And one way we may want to think about gauging what the community as a whole is interested in is maybe as a lead up or prior to the first open consultation where the stage is being set, do some sort of online uh, poll where you can go out to the community and people can forward links and you can get a sense from the community on what topics they are interested in and maybe that would help guide some of the workshop submissions that would come in three or four minutes later. So, thanks. Uh, th uh, thanks, Jim. Um, yes, for the workshop rooms, yes, we have to be a bit careful on, on those, but we do have um, rooms that can be with a little bit of imagination be round tables, uh, especially those rooms that are near uh, the main hall, um, if you, 11, 12, et cetera. Uh, they're fairly flat and the makeup is like a square table or a, a round table. So we're gonna be putting those workshops that indicated that uh, they want a round table for format there. They're the ones, uh, we are mostly gonna be using um, all the workshop rooms from um, the main assembly hall to the uh, Serpentine Bar. So, and the main room that we're gonna be using is um, uh, room 17. Conference Room 17. Okay, that is more of a plenary session and we can't really uh, change that. But the other workshop rooms, yes, I, th I do think we can. And it's quite impossible to move the, the uh, for furniture around in the rooms. I think that's very... Um, 
Uh, for indication of which stakeholder group the workshops came in, we just used the first proposer because um, it's not perfect, but uh, that's what we had. We, use, uh, we just presumed that the first proposer is the one that is the driving force behind that proposal. Uh, for the tags and the, yes, we use it as an indication of interest. I hope I use the word indication, <laughs> not that it is, uh, just an indication because those are the ones that um, people selected the most. So uh, statistics, it's a statistical sample, it's, it's not perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have three more speakers in the queue, and G wants to get in the queue as well. We'll allow you to do this in the room, but we're actually using the online queue, so perhaps you can go to that um, later, and maybe Luis can, can help you. Um, Niels Tenover is the next in the queue. Thank you very much, Chair, for this uh, opportunity. And as a member of the community and not a MAG member, I'd like to thank the MAG for the amount of work that goes into the preparation of the IGF, and of course, especially the host country for uh, providing even more support for this important, very important meeting in our multi-stakeholder environment. We're seeing that increasingly the promise made in the Tunis agenda that internet governance would be based on human rights principles is becoming a reality. So governments, companies, standards bodies and increase, are increasingly taking their responsibility. And they are following models developed in the UN for this, namely the UN guiding principles for business and human rights. This week, uh, a bit down the road, the UN Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression will launch a report uh, uh, at the Human Rights Council on the role of inf internet infrastructure providers to respect human rights and how to use human rights impact assessments to do so. We've also seen initiatives such as Ranking Digital Rights helping uh, companies understand their human rights impact. So somehow these human rights impact assessments are forming a symbol and a way forward in the multi-stakeholder model, bringing together the different stakeholders. And therefore, I'd like to recommend that we would find the time to discuss them at the IGF. As a member of the community and not a MAC member, I do not have access to which uh, uh, proposals are now uh, scored well, but I do really hope that there will be a session, merged or not, uh, discussing this, because it seems the way forward to strengthen a global rights-respecting network. Thank you. Very interesting comments. Next, we have Francois-Xavier Vial in the queue. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so my name is Francois Xavier Vialon. Um, I'm, represent, or I'm from the Technical University of Yverdon in Switzerland, and I have questions in regard to the data the Secretary had presented. Um, what do you include into the third proposal that came from the Community Digital Future? Could you elaborate a bit on that? And then in regard to the last table you showed uh, about the variance, uh, what, what is varying exactly? I don't understand uh, this measurement. Thank you. I'm not too sure what you want me to say about the tag, but um, it's just an indication um, of the interests of the community. Um, Uh, and which um, is what seems to be a theme of, of what people are talking about. We're not trying to tell people, but we're just saying, you know, these things came up and that is one of the new ones. Um, for the variance, that means that um, if, if a MAG member was looking at a workshop, that means that some MAG members rated that workshop very high and very relevant, et cetera, to, uh, and gave it a high mark, and some, some MAG members rated it uh, poorly. So there has to be some sort of reason for that. So it is worth looking at these workshops to see whether or not they rate them, because the, if it's based on the topic, then it may be worth including that topic on the schedule because that means that there's a lot of views on that topic and um, it's worth 
discussing. I mean, that's why we're here for. We're, uh, we're, we're a platform where people can d discuss issues and come to some sort of a common understanding. So with a high variance, that means that there isn't a very much common understanding. It's, it's disparate views. Yeah. Thank you, Changatai. I hope that helped clarify. We thought it might just be a good indicator of something which was contentious, and if it's contentious, that means there are strongly held views on either side, and that might be worthy of, of exploring further within the context of the IGF. <laughs> <laughs> I had the benefit of your yeah. explanation. Mm. Um, do you have the floor? Um, as today is the open community consultation, are you actually taking the floor as a member of the community or in your MAG member role? Because MAG members are meant to be primarily in listening mode. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, make a short intervention as national representative, but uh, also from the perspective of a MAG, new MAG member. Um, uh, first off, I would like to thank uh, Changatai for your uh, uh, presentation. and. Uh, after you know, uh, get all this uh, uh, information. I'm a bit concerned um, about our grading system. Um, from the the final 72 uh, top uh, uh, top listed uh, workshops, I feel it's uh, it's very problematic. First of all, um, in Asia we have 60 percent of the global population, but. Uh, only 20% make into the final 72. Even considering the any wildcard uh, proposals be included in the future, um, Asia Pacific is uh, obviously underrepresented. And uh, I'm wondering if in the future um, the, uh, the screening of proposals could take into account the weight of global population and uh, uh, distribution of the global population in different region, and uh, uh, also the users of internet, and the weight of internet economy for countries such as India, China, Japan, we deserve more representation. Second, I'm uh, I'm very much concerned about uh, the the proliferation of human rights topics in in our in our uh, in uh, in IGF work. Uh, almost 90% of the proposals I encountered in the, screen, in the screening process is about human rights. This is a disaster. Everything is about human rights. Food is, food is, is, uh, is for human rights. Trade is for human rights. We have more important topics that is about human rights, but uh, you know, which is more relevant uh, in, in IGF uh, area. For example, AI. If computers go beyond the singularity, when they gain ego, they may in the future dominate the human being and wipe out the us, the human race, as animals and useless things. That's also about human rights, which um, obviously this is more important and uh, um, you know, regulation of development of uh, AI is, deserves more attention. So we hope that uh, 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 in the future the proposals could be, you know, the pro uh, in the screening of the proposal, the relevance of the topics should have certain distribution of weight. For example, human rights. How many human rights topics can get, get into the final list? For example, we give them 10%. How about technology, right, like 30%? We need to balance uh, the, you know, the different type of topics into the final list, geographically, uh, geographically or thematically. Um, otherwise, I think uh, many uh, topics uh, I, I have been uh, treated unfairly and uh, many regions, particularly Asia Pacific region, China, we are, we are not treated unfairly. The, the, the membership of MAC is, uh, is not uh, uh, I don't know what happened in the, in the, in the screening process of the MAG members. The composition of MAG members is, uh, is lack of balance. And I think we, uh, in the future, we work for a, a better composition of MAG member and a, a better grading system for uh, uh, working shop screening. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, just a few comments. Um, 
for your first point, in um, I mean, I did say those words as well, that the um, according to population, but according to the number of proposals uh, from Asia Pacific, we had 20% from Asia Pacific and overall, and 18% made it into the top. So that is an indicator that it was more or less fair based on the, num based on the number of proposals that we received. But as has been said all the time, is that we do need to encourage more submissions, build the capacity of people from developing countries to participate in the, in the IGF and to discuss these topics because their voices must be heard. What's important to me is, is that we make progress, that we show that there is progress, that last year we may have had 15%, this year we have more. And that is part of what the Secretariat does as well, and that we are trying to encourage these national and regional IGFs as well to build capacity. It's not perfect, but as I mean, from my point of view, as long as we work towards improving that and then coming to what is a, um, a what can be seen by the most number of people as a fair distribution of the workshops. But um, just repeat my first statement, but as an indicate, just looking at the number of proposals that came in, yes, but we have to do, all of us have to do a lot of work to build the capacity to encourage people from developing countries, not just Asia Pacific, but from Africa, from all the other regions. The Latin American region, as I noted, is very good, but there's still work to be done on f all the other regions. Uh, oh, I, I will allow you a short response, and then I'm going to Marilyn Kay. I'd really like you to begin using the online queue in a moment, though. And um, after that, we'll move to the second part of this topic, which is uh, an overview of the main sessions. You have the floor for a quick response. Well, I want to say that uh, Asia deserves more respect. And uh, whatever, or no matter how, much, how many proposals from Asia Pacific, we deserve the uh, corresponding proportion uh, number of uh, workshops in the final list. And uh, I think it's not up to the people from the other region to judge whether this proposal from Asia Pacific is good or not. I think um, we, for example, if we have 80 final in the final list, Asia deserves like 50. And uh, it's up to Asia countries to decide which proposal is better or not. Thank you. I uh, the last sentence is that uh, I would like to say Anglo-Saxon word is overrepresented. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to be fairly direct in my response here as well. I think what you've just suggested is completely contradictory to what multi-stakeholder means and the way this forum has worked for the last 12 years, which is in a consensus mode. So multi-stakeholder really, and it's a global forum. Um, we can talk about this more offline, if you will, because um, I think our, our rules and our mandate is established by the United Nations Secretary General. We operate under UN rules. We're convened by the UN Secretary General and in a multi-stakeholder format, which means all views are meant to be represented in all of our decisions. They are all meant to be heard. They're all meant to be respected both ways. And that's what we're striving to do when we put together the, uh, the program here. So we can talk about this perhaps some more over the next couple of days or later, but it really is time now to move to the next speaker in the queue who's been very politely waiting, and then we'll move to the main session topic after that. So Marilyn, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. My name is Marilyn Kay. I should have said this in my earlier intervention, but I think it's just worth sharing with all of you uh, something you'll hear more about later today, and that is within the NRI um, calls of the NRI network, this conversation about what fits under rights online, whether it's human rights online or rights online, was actually a major part of our discussion. Um, there are some MAG members here who are on the call. The focal point was on the call. But we also struggled with uh, whether access, capacity building, enhanced access, uh, should fit under that umbrella. We also struggled with what we would put under the concept of the digital economy, new and emerging technologies, and I think the, um, to one small part, that's worth the MAG kind of examining 
the rating, the top two ratings right now need to be kind of picked apart. The, the, the umbrella topic needs to be picked apart a little bit to see what fits under it because I think you'll probably have a similar experience to the discussion that we had on the NRI network call and that is where do we put AI? Where do we put new and emerging technologies? Where do we put enhanced access as building blocks to support true access online? Is that human rights? Is it rights online. So I just share that. I think there'll be more discussion about that later during the NRI session. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. It's a good point. Chengatai would like to come in on that and then we will move to the main session's topic. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Marilyn. You re reminded me about my second, the second part of my response as well. Yes, I mean, that is a fact. Um, and I mean, human rights is a big topic and it covers basically everything. That's why, that is one of the reasons why I think it's um, right up there on the top. And maybe it is a function that we may have to, you know, uh, define because all these are self-defined. The secretary didn't say human rights is this, artificial intelligence is this. I mean, the community defined these uh, tags. So um, maybe that's one thing we can look at for the future and see whether we can Thank you, Changatai. So it's time to move to uh, the main sessions review. Um, last year, we actually had a main sessions working group, uh, which is quite active in terms of trying to evolve um, our procedures and criteria and timelines and that sort of thing. This year, the MAG felt that that was still um, fairly accurate, so it did not constitute a formal MAG working group. But Fabio Wagner and Liesl Franz both agreed to um, drive a high-level sort of review and to help move the process forward from a sort of administrative standpoint, I guess, if I can use that word. So I'd like to ask um, Liesl and Flavio to give a quick introduction to where we are with respect to the MAG's task of choosing the main session program, and then again, we will open it up for comments from, from the floor. I'm not sure who's going to go first. Liesl, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, everybody. Um, I, I guess just to start, I would say that the working group on the main sessions um, that we that was established last year was really to um, put together a set of guidelines for how uh, main sessions um, should be uh, planned, planned for, and conducted at the at the IGF. So that that's what the the remit of the working group was. Uh, we do have a very good set of guidelines. I think now um, for how the main session should be conducted, including principles and requirements, as well as things that main session proposers might, uh, main session facilitators might consider as they plan for the main sessions. One of the most important components, I think, of that is um, the the time between the selection of the main sessions by the MAG and the con and the convening of the IGF um, is a very is the call for a very robust engagement program with the stakeholder community in planning and preparing for the main session. So I think that's um, a, a very important part of that um, of the guidelines. Um, it also sets out a timeline of deadlines and things like that uh, that includes that stakeholder con consultation. Um, so it's very useful in that regard. Um, and for this year, we just updated the timeline for uh, to accommodate the the, uh, the timing for the IGF this year. Um, uh, just to back up a bit and talk about um, main sessions for those that may not be as familiar, um, the main set what we call main sessions for the IGF um, has sort of a very distinct character um, in that they uh, tend to be uh, wor uh, workshops um, that take place in larger rooms that um, take on broad topics that might be of interest to uh, a larger part of the community that um, have a longer set time frame for the for their conduct than a workshop say they have historically some of them have been three hours um, um, they and they are 
are afforded the translation into the, um, all the UN official languages, unlike the workshops, which may get translated in one or two on occasion, but don't have the full access to the full translation services. Um, they have typically, over the course of the IGF, uh, focused on the main themes of the IGF, security, openness, privacy, diversity, uh, critical internet resources, um, and uh, over time have also, uh, we've tried to make them capture, capture the, th the themes and topics that have come out of the workshop proposals that have come in to the uh, end for consideration by the MAG. Um, so given the briefing that you just got on sort of the, the, the preponderance of tags uh, on cybersecurity and gender and AI and human rights and internet governance and freedom of expression online, access and diversity, um, those are the kinds of things that we might expect to see in the uh, main sessions either as the general topic or brought into the discussion um, by uh, by the uh, facilitators for the, each of the main sessions. Um, that's kind of it for the, the nuts and bolts of it, but um, what we'll do, what is showing on the screen now is the set of main session proposals that um, MAG members have proposed for, for this year. Um, and it is traditional that the main session proposals do come from MAG members and often based on, like I said, based on the incoming proposals and the subjects that um, are deemed that, that uh, have a large uh, interest. Um, so the, uh, Flavio, should I turn it over to you partly because I can't really see the, <laughs> the screen even with my glasses, so I'll have to find my papers, but if you don't mind to, to, to uh, read those out and perhaps if people have questions uh, or comments about them, we'd be interested in hearing you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Liesl. This is Flavio Wagner for the record. Uh, just one, uh, another uh, important thing to mention before I read the, the, the titles there is that uh, there are two other main session proposals. Uh, I think we will speak about them later on. Uh, one from the NRIs, the National and Regional IGFs, that uh, in the last uh, three years have had a main session in their own, uh, and it will be organized by the NRIs themselves, and also one main session uh, for the dynamic coalitions. So then uh, these two are not uh, shown there in, on the screen. Uh, and uh, from the nine proposals we have there, uh, we will have uh, to select four or five, depending on the slots and on, on the time, uh, the duration of each of the, the proposals. Most are for three hours, but maybe some of them may be accommodated in two hours or 90 minutes. So, in fact, from the nine proposals there, we would have to select four or five, and this will be the, the, the task of the MAG in, in the next two days. So these are the proposals that came uh, from the MAG members. Uh, gender inclusion and the future of the internet the impact of digitization on politics, public trust and democracy, digital transformation, how do we shape its socio-economic and labor impacts for good, human and social dimensions of the internet, empowering global cooperation on cybersecurity for sustainable <laughs> development and peace, cutting edge exponential technologies, data for sustainable development roadmaps, Strengthening international cooperation in the context of the IGF between relevant organizations working on enhancing internet security and combating cybercrime. And local interventions, global impacts, how can international multi-stakeholder cooperation address internet shutdowns, encryption, and data flows? So uh, this, uh, this main session shall be discussed in detail in uh, tomorrow and, and after tomorrow uh, during the MAG meeting to select a final list of four or five from them. Thank you. Thank you, Flavio and Liesl. Uh, Flavio, you made a good point. The sessions that are listed here um, are just those that the MAG actually needs to make a determination across. They do not include, as you said, the main sessions um, for dynamic coalitions and for the national and regional IGF initiatives. Um, 
just as another point of, of information as well, the um, Swiss hosts are also um, working with the MAG to try and sort of reinvigorate some of the opening ceremony characteristics. Um, they've tended to be a long um, sort of parade of individual speeches, and there's a couple of proposals in from them to try and um, reinvigorate that and give um, a little bit more focus to that. So the MAG will also be discussing that over the um, course of the next few days as well. Um, so at this point, um, I'd like to see if there are any kind of comments or general reflections, suggestions for how we can work to make the main sessions even more vibrant and inviting and engaging. Um, they are a key feature of, of the IGF and they do help set the stage for um, many of the other um, workshops that are actually um, encompassed in the program. I have Marilyn in the queue, but I think that may have been left over from, from before. She says, yes, she is no longer in the queue. Keeping in mind Marilyn's earlier comment, about 20 to 30 seconds before it actually registers. I'm going to wait and see if there's anybody else who is looking for, for the floor. Oh, okay. So I have um, Mark Carvel and then Peter Majek. So Mark, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Mark of our UK government, uh, a former MAG member. Um, actually, uh, my request for the floor was, goes back to the previous agenda item on workshop proposals, so I guess I'm too late for that. But, uh, Please go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to um, emphasize the desirability, and I think it perhaps is reflected in the main session proposals, that the IGF captures emerging issues like digital transformation and, and uh, the impacts of AI and other technologies. So I welcome uh, the elements of that which are in some of the uh, main session proposals. Uh, and my question back to the workshop proposals was the, uh, whether there was um, a sense of comfort that the IGF is addressing some of these new emerging uh, challenges uh, and whether the Secretariat or, the, or, or, or somebody could comment on that. And if I can just slip in another question I had then, which was about online child safety. I wasn't sure whether online child safety is going to feature in the IGF program uh, in Geneva. But uh, on, on this, I, I, I support the MAG looking at main session proposals with the sense of this is the opportunity to engage on some critical uh, issues that are going to impact lives. Uh, this is very much sympathetic to the themes of the G20 and the G7. So this is a very welcome um, feature, if you like, of the IGF at the highest level of main session, looking at cutting edge emerging technologies, transformative technologies, uh, with also a link across to sustainable development. So I very much welcome that. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And we'll take those discussions forward into the MAG discussion tomorrow. Um, Peter Majcik, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I'm also a member of the community and not a MAG member. I represent Access Now, an international digital rights organization. Um, I want to I can reinforce uh, Neil's intervention. Um, I think it's, it's very important, and, and we uh, do appreciate this opportunity to, part to participate in the open consultation. Um, and uh, as far as the human rights representation, I, I think it's really a victory in a lot of ways that human rights um, have found such a prominent um, place in the agenda, and um, there's such interest from the community to bring human rights issues uh, to the IGF and that um, it wasn't always this way and perhaps this shows the relevance um, that people see in this institution and, and the ongoing discussions um, that such uh, critical and timely and um, uh, important issues are raised uh, in this forum. I do want to express our support for um, the, the final main session proposal on local interventions, global impacts. Um, the uh, widespread um, and increasing uh, number of internet shutdowns and other intentional disruptions of connectivity threatens a range of human rights um, and as well as 
global economic development and the development of even local digital economies. Um, the impacts are still being measured, but there's no question that the frequency is increasing um, and that the uh, impacts on people's daily lives as well as their trust in the internet itself um, are, are harmed and damaged by these events. Um, and so, yeah, we do want to uh, express support for that proposal and others um, on this really pressing issue of internet shutdowns. And I finally do want to say that I think it's appropriate, um, given that the IGF annual session will be in Geneva, and that there is a strong link to human rights given uh, the seat of the Human Rights Council here. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Marcus Kummer. Marcus, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm taking the floor, floor in my capacity as co-facilitator of the Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity. And uh, seen from the Best Practice Forum perspective, what we did last year didn't really work. To have an omnibus session where we allowed a main session given to all Best Practice Forums. What I would see that could work if the best practice forums can actually feed into a main session. And from the best practice forum on cybersecurity, we definitely would welcome feeding into a main session on cybersecurity. I noticed there are two proposals on the table related to cybersecurity. They could easily be merged, but uh, important seen from our best practice forum would really be the opportunity to feed into a main session and to enrich the main session. And, Based on the tagging, I think cybersecurity seems to be an issue that is high on the priority list of the community. And likewise, as there is a best practice forum on gender, and gender also is an up upcoming issue that has very strong support, uh, that would also make sense to have a main session on gender, allowing precisely the best practice forum to feed into. And as I have the floor, I have a hard stop at 12.30. I base my program on the preliminary list of uh, the agenda that was published on the website. Uh, and I would like also to report on the best practice forum on cybersecurity on our work. So if it cannot be uh, done before 12.30, if we can take it up at the beginning of the afternoon session. Thank you. We have Rui, would like to take the floor. Um, just one, one second. Um, uh, Marcus, thank you, thank you very much for those comments, and in particular, um, really look forward to you know, net an, yet another spin on improving um, the work of the IGF through the best practice forums and, and integration into the main sessions and hopefully driving even more visibility to, to the very important work. We'll actually go to the next um, agenda item in just a moment, which was an update on best practice forums. But I think I'm actually getting a request for somebody else to take the floor that's not actually in the queue. Or not showing in the queue, but evidently in the queue. Actually, he's not connected to the audio. I'm trying to connect him. Thank you. OK, th thank you. Um, again, if there's anything we can do to um, help, Luis is there to help with those that are um, trying to uh, use the new system here. Um, so I thank all the, the speakers with their comments on the main session. Um, we're still somewhat earlier in that process as, composed, as a, compared to the workshop selection process. It'll form a significant piece of our discussions over the next couple of days and remain open and attuned to any comments or suggestions from from the community on those topics. If we move now to um, agenda item seven, which is an update from the IGF best practice forums, of which this year the MAG um, supported three, um, one on um, gender and access, one on cybersecurity, and one on local content. And Marcus, do you want to say a few words, building on from your last comment? And then, again, we'll open the floor for um, reaction from the community. Marcus, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. That works out perfectly. Well, as you will remember, the Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity had the mandate last year and got started. And after Guadalajara, we actually continued having uh, discussions and calls and discussed on how best to uh, continue, as it was conceived as a multi-year program right from the beginning. Uh, once uh, the mandate was renewed, we had a call in uh, uh, end of May, 
and our lead expert Martin van Hornbeck reported, I think, on the last MAG meeting where we are. So the work is ongoing, and I'm reporting on this and uh, thanking my co-facilitator Segun. He was not able to be on the call on the last uh, call, so. Uh, I take it on me to report on where we are. Uh, as you saw in the proposal we submitted, the idea was this time to draw very much on IGF work that had been carried out in the past and connecting enabling the next billion in particular and looking at the relevant policy recommendation where the cybersecurity best practice forum could actually have an impact. And we also decided to draw on the global network now, existing network of NRIs, that we actually ask them also for input. And we had NRIs also participating in our call. So the work that we decided that what needed to be done was on the one hand develop a questionnaire, uh, and that would build on the policy paper on connecting and enabling the next billion, and that is in process, and we will look at the outcome that's based on voluntary work from the members of the uh, expert group that participate in the best practice forum, and on the other hand, also draw up a list of relevant organizations to which we would actively, proactively reach out to and send the questionnaire. That has proved uh, very valid experience uh, in the past years. So this is where we are. And as a parallel approach, uh, one member of the group also will look at whether there are any individual issues uh, that might be uh, worthwhile looking into. But it was also agreed that we should not let ourselves guide by the news. That's two weeks ago it was ransomware that was very high up on the list. Uh, so maybe we should look a little bit deeper and see whether we could make a deep dive in one emerging issue related to cybersecurity. Uh, this is where we are. Work is underway, and uh, obviously uh, interested MAG members and non-MAG members are invited to join the uh, mailing list and join our calls. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Are there, of the three... Um Marcus was speaking initially somewhat generically to best practice forms and our intent um, with respect to the IGF program and then specifically to the cybersecurity BPF. Are there anybody who wants to speak specifically on the BPF on local content or gender and access or shall we move directly to questions or comments from the floor? <coughs> okay, Cheryl. I'll give you the floor. Reminder, we're using the online queuing system, but there's nobody else in the queue, so Cheryl, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. I think I, I, did, I did try to use it. I'll get better at it. Sorry about that. Just, um, just on uh, the best practice forum on gender, Jack is leading that, um, and I'm helping her co-facilitate that, and I wanted to mention that we did meet, um, and we are sort of moving forward some of the work from last year and have uh, been working on the scope of uh, finding uh, so some of the gaps, I think, in terms of what's out there um, in information on what the different stakeholder groups are also doing in certain areas. And so we're now sort of collecting all of that and we'll have another call next week. So just a quick update. That, that's great, thank you, Cheryl. And you did appear in the queue. Raquel, is there anything you wanted to say on local content? No? Any comments from the floor? Again, the best practice forms were started, I think, four years ago um, in response to um, some of the suggestions for how we might actually improve um, the work of the IGF. And I think they've proven to be very successful and have really delivered a lot of good information. And one of the things the MAG wanted to address um, this year was trying to find a way to give them even more visibility, if you will, make them much more integral to the work of the work of the IGF. So we are open to any further suggestions or comments on how we might do that as well. And I guess Suman, you have the floor, 
and if you could indicate whether or not you're speaking as a MAG member or in your personal capacity, again, given this is the open consultation. Thank you. Well, thanks, Chair. Actually, I'm uh, talking that uh, speaking as a, I was one of the coordinators for the IPCC's BPF last year uh, in that three years, and uh, we have produced output document. And also, the IXP BPF was uh, last year uh, concluded, and there is the output document as well. My concern is that uh, we have prepared some wonderful document, and uh, uh, from our capacity, we're trying to propagate to many forums. But uh, I'm just wondering that if it's possible that from uh, IGF or from even Secretary General, like, if you can uh, send the document to the governments or the relevant bodies like ministry or the regulators. So I know many countries, they're actually uh, kind of uh, in a dilemma of how to uh, make a policy or guideline for deploying efficiency in the government organizations or in the country. This document might be very helpful, actually, if we can uh, uh, make an arrangement to send it to them, because many of them doesn't go to website or doesn't participate in this kind of forum, so government, all the government doesn't have that clue. So I just uh, take the opportunity to, to propose something that if we can do like that. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's an excellent idea. And maybe your colleagues sitting next to you can even put it into some of the communications and outreach <laughs> activities as well, given he's leading the, uh, the working group there. I don't see any other requests for the queue at this point in time. So with that, I would suggest we move to item eight, which is um, uh, policy options for connecting and enabling the next billions, phase three. Again, this follows the first two years of a connecting and enabling the next billion and is a major um, intercessional policy work, again, also addressing um, you know, the, the um, imperative of continuing to make the IGF work um, more relevant. So Raquel, do you want to say a few words? Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, so uh, the, the idea approved by the MAG is to continue with the connecting and enabling um, um, and, and enabling uh, the next billion. And uh, the proposal is now to focus on concrete um, examples and to focus on a few SDGs. Uh, the SDGs who, which were selected is are four uh, about education, uh, five about gender, and nine, which is infrastructure and has a specific mention on internet issues. Um, there is a, a call for inputs uh, for contributions that should be out soon. And, um, and so I think that's the, the, the summary version of how we, we can continue with this work. Uh, phase one analyzed more the policy options. Phase two went down to the SDGs and now we can go down into uh, a few of them and, and, and showcase uh, within the IGF work. I think that's it. Thank you, Raquel. That was very concise. So this is where we open it up to the community again if there are any specific comments or questions on that initiative. I do have Sagoon in the, the queue. Again, Sagoon, is you're a, a MAG member, are you speaking in that capacity or is? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. I want to speak in my capacity, as uh, individual capacity. Um, I just want to re echo what my colleagues said here on the importance of uh, uh, repackaging or how we can make some of the outcomes of the best, uh, best practice forum available to the countries and all that. I have a, uh, a, peculiar, a particular uh, scenario in my country, especially the outcomes of the uh, connecting the next billion. You know, while we were having some discussions, I made some recommendations on the need for the agency in my country that's in charge of the uh, information technology development. I think uh, they are more interested in seeing a package uh, document, you know, widely out. I don't know how much of the resources that we have under the IGL. Some of these uh, document or the outcome, I think um, in a kind of which is from like this, they can be packaged so that some of the ministers that are here they will go out back with something that they can work with. Because like you said, in most of the development country um, agents and all that, not many of them go to the website. Even if they go to the website, they don't even spend so much uh, time on website looking for documents and all that. 
So I just want to re-echo that, that there is a need for us to repackage the outcome of the best practices. We need to package it, document it, summarize it, and probably distribute it in a forum that we have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shagun. Mark Carvel, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Lynn. And um, uh, uh, what I want to say is very much in line with, with previous comments about um, the application and uh, value of these tangible outcomes from the IGF, uh, the Best Practice Fora, uh, and uh, the Connecting the Next Billions initiative. Um, First of all, on behalf of the UK, I just want to express deep appreciation for the hard work put in by the, uh, the MAG volunteers and leading on all this very valuable intercessional work. It's, um, it's delivering on uh, a recommendation from the CSTD in respect of tangible outcomes. And at the time of the retreat last year, uh, one of our proposals was that um, the MAG undertake some exercise of evaluation of the impact, um, the communication of these uh, outcome documents, um, and uh, the take-up and, and, and feedback, uh, with feedback positive and constructive that will enhance uh, this part of, this vitally important part of the IGF's uh, work and mandate. So I, I just reiterate what we said at the time of the retreat, that um, if, um, in view of all the hard work going on, uh, it's, it's important to assess the impact and how these outcomes are actually being um, absorbed by policymakers, by community uh, advocates, leaders, and so on, civil society, private sector, as well as governments, and um, uh, so that we get a sense of uh, you know, the real impact and, and uh, um, uh, uh, in terms of addressing challenges and creating new opportunities and bringing uh, um, all uh, constituencies in the internet sphere um, fully up to speed. The BPFs can do an enormous amount of work for that. I'm sure, you know, to some extent it's happening, but we need some kind of uh, assessment, I think, to help uh, uh, reassure us that all this work is, is having real impact and uh, uh, allow us to understand how the work can be further enhanced in future. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Um, good comments, both from you and Shigun. Um, Suman, I think you've requested the floor. Again, no? Okay. Um, then with that, Item, there's nobody in the queue, so we'll move to an update on the national and regional IGF initiatives, agenda item nine. And I think Anya, the, um, is the focal point within the Secretariat for the NRIs is going to kick that, that session off. She said they're almost there. Thank you very much, and I uh, would like to greet you all. As uh, the MAG chair said, yes, my name is Anya Gengo. I work uh, from the IGF Secretariat very closely with the colleagues that are organizing many national, sub-regional, regional IGFs, but also youth IGFs. So uh, we do have a couple of slides to share with you just for the purposes of uh, uh, you having the visual information on who are the NRIs and what do they do within their respective communities, as well as some information on the official records that we have. So I believe you can see it. So just a quick reflection to the origin and to the background of the NRIs. How did they start their own, their own work? Uh, I believe we all, thank you. I believe we all know here that the uh, IGF itself as a global forum stems its mandate from the Tunis agenda. Uh, these days we are speaking about the exist, existing uh, more than 100 national, regional uh, and youth IGFs but yet they do not, they are not man mandated by the Tunis agenda, but they exist. So within the agenda, there was no specific call for the NRIs, but uh, what I think we should uh, notice is that the multi-stakeholder approach has been recognized as the funda fundamental principle of the IGF's work, as well as within the paragraph 80, 
the, there, was, there was the encouragement of the development of multi-stakeholder processes at national, regional, international level. So this gives a background for the existence of the, of the NRIs. Uh, if we track back uh, to history, the existence of the NRIs, then uh, in 2006, so basically uh, in line when the global IGF started, we can track the very first ones. So Caribbean IGF probably has the longest history uh, when it comes to body NRIs as a network. Their working principles, so first of all, what we need to understand is that the NRIs work as a network. So the way they work was built by a consensus among the existing initiatives. So they agreed to follow the core uh, principles and characteristics of the global IGF. And uh, what the Secretariat um, is doing is just facilitating the process of recognizing uh, the uh, initiatives as the official IGF initiatives. They are of an organic nature, which means that nobody was calling for them, but there was a need within the community to come up with an effective mechanism of uh, dealing with the um, internet governance related matters in certain communities. Uh, something that's very, very important for us all to understand is that they are fully independent and they are autonomous. So the, the collaboration that exists within the global IGF with the colleagues at national and regional levels uh, is basically that, just a collaboration. So there is no hierarchy between any of the IGFs. The stakeholders within the NRIs act on equal footing, just as within global IGF. As I said, they are of a bottom-up nature which means they are organizing once they see that there is a need within the community to organize a forum. Multi-stakeholder, which means that the forums are organized by the multi-stakeholder organizing teams. Fully open and transparent, inclusive, and of course, non-commercial. Uh, if we just uh, very quickly look at the um, growth of the NRIs across the three IGFs mandate, then you can really see the difference that uh, in 2011, we had 37. In 2015, which is the end of the second mandate, we had 37 again. But in 2017, there is a really rapid growth uh, where at this uh, present moment, we're speaking about 87 IGFs that are officially recognized, but 14 uh, of the uh, NRIs that are information. And information is a term that we introduced two years ago altogether as an NRI network. Uh, just to recognize the colleagues that are internally fully organized, but that don't have the enough resources to organize their annual meetings. So if we look up at the graph, then we can see basically what's the breakdown uh, of the um, NRIs as a total number per national, regional IGFs and also youth IGFs. These are the upcoming meetings. So in June, uh, the Eurodig ended two days ago. That is a uh, I believe well-known regional IGFs for Europe that exist now for years. Peru IGF was happening at the same time. After we are done with this meeting, Nepal will be organizing their own meeting, which is the first IGF in Nepal. Barbados as well, and Central Asia will be organizing its second IGF meeting that is this year hosted by the government of Tajikistan. This is just for you to see uh, that the NRIs are really widely spread across the world and that there is a very solid balance if you uh, want to kind of do the break, uh, break up by, um, by regions or by continents or what we do, we, we track also by the UN regional groups. Uh, so I wouldn't say there is a, that anyone is just uh, staying behind in terms of the uh, engagement on the national and regional levels. Now, what do they do? So I think just for us to understand what's the value of the NRIs, we just need to uh, ask ourselves how the things are working in practice. There is really not a huge difference between what we are doing on a global level and what the colleagues are doing within their respective countries and regions. So they are they're having the multi-stakeholder organizing teams. They are asking their own community through a public call for inputs, what are the issues of relevance? They are building the program agenda based on those inputs, meaning in a bottom-up manner. They engage the community to implement what has been mapped, and of course, they organize the annual meeting. This is how I look, uh, like to look at it. So basically, as a pyramid where everything starts from the bottom, we have the recognized need, we have the stakeholder engagement in place. Uh, what the NRIs agreed is that the multi-stakeholder organizing teams are composed of at least three stakeholder groups 
uh, per the IGF classification, though what I can say from my experience is that all of them have uh, four stakeholder groups, almost all of them. Um, the, um, what's very important to understand also for the NRIs as well as for us, that the purpose really uh, of the national and regional IGFs is not just to organize a one or two days long meeting and then the story is over and then we're going again next year. But there is something that's called the intersessional work on the national and regional levels. And uh, for the last two years, this is something that's becoming a trend within the NRIs where the forum, the existence of the forum is recognized as something that's very useful for the community. So I just um, uh, put a couple of examples here. Uh, for example, the Port Portugal IGF is organizing the multiply sessions across the country that at the end are just being finalized with one annual meeting. And that is done just to build the capacity within the country, but also to raise awareness about the uh, IG issues. The Paraguay IGF, for example, what has recognized last year that they lack the youth engagement. So they are very proactive this year, organizing webinars for the university students, trying to tell the young people, the future experts, what, are, what is the internet governance, what is the IGF, what are the core, core principles, and why are they needed to engage in order to, uh, in order to change things within their country. CEDIC, or the sub-regional IGFs that, it, that is covering the southeastern Europe, uh, is also doing some great things. I think we have a representative here. Maybe we will hear more about it. But for example, aside of organizing every year their own annual meeting, they do monthly briefings on um, mapped IG issues within the region, and they do a regional remote hub that I think goes uh, monthly. Um, I really want to say is that um, the way how they format and present just visually those mapped issues is very, very interesting. And uh, on one occasion, I did ask how do they do that process. So I was invited to join them for two days, which mean, means that I was basically the whole day and the whole night with the colleagues. It's a really uh, hard work behind all this. But they are the only ones within the region that are doing this. And I think the value has been recognized. Later, we will, we will see what's the major outcome. The Japan IGF is also a very good example on how they run their own intersessional work. So besides having the annual meeting, every month the organizing committee and the wider community is gathering within the premises that they're using as their offices, and they are discussing the major developments and relevant IG issues. Everything is documented, and uh, you can find everything on their website. It's, it's on Japanese, but they also um, uh, do think of us as a global community, so they do uh, summaries. Uh, they translate it on, on English, so that's also available to us. And I added a couple of examples, which was very, very hard to choose from, just for you to visually see what do the NRIs do within their community, because I think that's very important to understand the value of these forums. So the first one in this IGF cycle was the uh, National IGF of Trinidad and Tobago. That was in January. And the issues that they were discussing was the role of the internet and the digital economy in the sustainable development of their own country. There was the online participation available. Uh, there was the English translation, so we were able to follow the meeting. And the outcomes will soon be published also through the IGF Secretariat. And you will see that the colleagues did really an impressive work, especially given the fact that it wasn't easy at all for them to engage the stakeholders just to recognize that um, this, this kind of a forum should be organized within their country. The second one is, um, that I picked is Afghanistan IGF. There was the first national IGF organized uh, in this country. It was very impressive and it was, I would say, very different. It gathered a, really a lot of participants, almost 200, counting the um, online participants. The issues that they have discussed were very broad. They were in line with the access and diversity, cybersecurity, youth and gender, new emerging issues. Uh, they also uh, allowed for us, as the global community, to engage with them. There was a simultaneous translation to English language. So many of the um, members of the global IGF community were on those calls. Uh, and what you see on these photos, especially the one on the left side, was something that was very, very innovative and really was recognized uh, as very important within the NRI's network, which is the IGF, IGF Afghanistan Kids Academy. So these are children that are probably seven, eight years old. And they were there listening to the expert speakers on internet governance on how can they use safely the internet as at the end of the day they are online. 
So I think Marilyn is here. She was uh, invited as an inter international expert uh, in Kabul where she was traveling. So maybe later we can just hear practically how this worked uh, in Kabul. As I said, CEDIG, as the IGF for Southeastern Europe, uh, hosted their third annual meeting in uh, Ohrid. They had almost uh, 200 participants that were attending on site from 24 different countries, which means also outside a bit of the mapped region, with a lot of issue, different issues that were discussed. Uh, one thing that was new there is that they have organized the track for young people. They called it the CEDIG Youth School. And uh, Aida probably as a coordinate, one of the coordinators there can later tell us more about uh, the capacity building and the need for the capacity building in the region. What I can say and what colleagues told me is that this year they applied a very specific strategy which resulted in attracting more governments within the region. And really when you look into the stakeholder uh, breakdown, you can see a very solid balance of all the stakeholder groups, which previously for the two meetings wasn't, case, wasn't the case. Sri Lanka IGF ho uh, hosted its third meeting. It was a very impressive meeting uh, that had a lot of different tracks aside of the core program itself. Uh, so they organized a special track for the young people. They called it the Youth IGF Initiative. Again, uh, a track organized by the multi-stakeholder organizing teams there. Uh, they also dedicated a track to women uh, of the IGF Sri Lanka, the role of gender. And uh, they also had something that we call the IGF Village, where our stakeholders can come and uh, just present their work. So the Sri Lanka organized that, where many national but also international uh, stakeholders and organizations could come and just uh, engage with the community there and say this is what we're doing and this is how you can engage with us. This is something that's very important. Why do we find the NRIs very important and maybe better to use the word useful. So how do they help the global IGF program? Uh, I think Marcus, when he was speaking on the BPF of cybersecurity, said the key word. Uh, on our calls, they were the NRIs. So there are two ways how they support. The one way is that they submit concrete written outcomes from their annual meetings that are being brought in a bottom-up manner to the intersessional work of the global IGF. So you will see, uh, if you stay also with us tomorrow and uh, the day after, that the best practice forums this year, as well as they did last year, really count on the inputs that are coming from the communities of the NRIs. And I think our consultants, uh, experts are here. They were working last year on the BPF, so they can also say that we received a significant number of contributions from the NRIs with a very, very valuable content. The difference between that content and the other types of content that you receive is that it really comes from the people. It's a bottom-up, in a bottom-up process. And of course, they are the direct contributors to the IGF's intersectional work as they participate in the call. They help the brainstorming process and they just contribute with, with their ideas, uh, given the fact that the NRIs are indeed experts within their community with a lot of experience in various spheres. NRIs collectively do work together, and there's, a, I think, a really uh, nice process in place. So this photo that you see on, the, on your screens is uh, the photo of all the speakers of the NRIs from the last year's IGF. So the main session last year that was uh, given to the NRIs was dealing with access, secure internet funding sources, and creating more awareness about the internet governance, as well as the purpose of the stakeholder engagement. It was a three hours long session where 42 uh, IGF initiatives had their own representatives in a role of speakers. It really offered a very rich content, and probably due to the fact that there was a really big number of speakers, uh, the community did uh, maybe lack of of the interaction within the audience, but hopefully this year, uh, if the room setup will allow, that will be changed. And one of the maybe even most useful for the community long-term speaking places was the booth that the NRIs had within the IGF village. So many of us were there, we were following the traffic, and a lot of community just outside, external to the NRIs was coming as they were interested to hear about the good work, how they can engage with the colleagues or how they can maybe start their own IGFs as they've seen that the community uh, would need one. Uh, also what the NRIs collaboratively did last year was developing the toolkit. So that was the first written advisory document that was um, developed by the NRIs that reflects the major core IGF principles. 
Uh, it has been done last year, um, end of last year, beginning of this year, but I think what's the major update and most important update this year is that this toolkit so far has been translated to five out of six official UN languages by the volunteers from the NRI's network, and I think that for itself really speaks about the uh, engaged uh, initiatives within a network and, and just the seriousness of it. The, um, as I said at the beginning, there's really a good working process in place when it comes about the NRIs um, collectively. So starting after the Mexico IGF meeting, the NRIs did come with a provisional plan of what they want to do for this year, and there are really a lot of items. So uh, they did submit a proposal for the NRIs main, main session. We run a very, very extensive and long public call for inputs in order to bottom up, try to see what's the topic of mutual interest that would reflect the NRI's interests. And the colleagues said that rights in the digital or online world as the major area of interest is something that's relevant for everyone. So we will be working on, on that and trying to build a title within this area of, of interest. The, Oh, sorry. The NRI's collaborative session is basically the NRI's working meeting that is open to everyone and that is happening uh, every year at the annual IGF meeting. So the plan is also to continue this year with, with this meeting where the global IGF, which means the IGF Secretariat, the MAG Chair, but also the colleagues from UNDESA would meet the colleagues from the NRI's just to map, reflect what has been done so far and what should be improved for the next IGF cycle. Um, one of the uh, new things this year that's going to be discussed tomorrow uh, during the MAG meeting and probably the day after tomorrow is a new set of sessions that the NRIs would like to organize. Just due to the fact that uh, we are very much with limited space when it comes about the annual IGF meeting and uh, with uh, relatively limited intersessional work in terms of covering maybe four or five major are areas of interests, the NRIs did offer uh, to, or to join, to collaborate together, and to organize a set of substantive sessions. So just to simplify it, that would mean that, for example, Japan IGF and Kenya IGF and Trinidad and Tobago IGF and uh, uh, Asia Pacific IGF would work on a topic of their own interest and just show to us uh, what are, what's, what's of relevance for their own regions and hopefully show to us that these issues are indeed different across countries and regions, but it, if we work together, more specifically, then we can um, we can kind of map the area better and uh, develop certain proposals for potential solutions. Uh, the uh, the boot within the IGF village, of course, is going to be continued practice, which I think this year we will be working on developing some uh, info material that's going to be of relevance for the community. And uh, the plan is to continue the informal gatherings wherever the opportunity would allow. The latest one was at Eurodic, where many of the European national uh, IGFs, also CDIG, were there present. They had their own meeting just to discuss uh, together what are the plans for the future and use that opportunity to face-to-face -face each other and plan ahead. If you are interested to contribute to the NRIs, then I would just advise to start either from the NRIs websites or maybe from the Secretariat's, I mean, the IGF's website where we uh, have all the uh, colleagues listed or we're willing to put you in contact with the colleagues. Or if you would like to learn more of any about the specific IGFs, you can also contact the IGF Secretariat where we would be glad to, uh, to assist. And obviously, uh, the regular virtual meetings that are happening every month, once or two times, they are open to everyone and you are more than welcome to join to those meetings and contribute with your, your ideas. So I think this is, uh, yes, I am at the end of my presentation. This will be very basic for me uh, at the beginning, and I think we have time maybe now to open the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. Um, that was a great presentation, very informative, and you know, the NRIs just contribute significantly to the ongoing discussion on internet governance across the world, and I think we've seen just a small indication of sort of the energy and the contributions they're making. We have um, two speakers in the queue. We have until the top of the hour, so if there are more questions um, you know, or more comments, we should do that, or if there are any other additional um, uh, suggestions from the room. So the two people I have in the queue at the moment are Julia Wano and then Sheeta, you have the floor. And apparently there's somebody else in the queue back there as well. We'll put you in as third. 
So Julie, you yes. have the floor. Hello. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm sorry. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry, uh, I have to go back to item eight because I, <laughs> I requested the floor a bit later. So I apologize for that. So I, I really, we are really thrilled. Oh, first of all, I'll introduce myself. So I represent Internet Without Borders, Internet Sans Frontières, so a digital rights uh, uh, NGO based in, based in France. Um, and uh, we, we are particularly delighted that, uh, of, about the item eight and specifically its focus on SDG uh, number nine. Um, on this, uh, I would like to uh, flag to the MAG the issue of um, uh, access costs and specifically uh, transparency in access to international bandwidth for, for telcos and their um, impact on internet access costs for communities. Uh, obviously, these are, the, these are the first hindrances to uh, global connectivity and specifically connectivity of the next billion located in the global south. So we are really, really happy and looking forward to uh, having this being dealt with during the, the next IGF. And also um, going a bit more back <laughs> behind on the internet shutdown issue, we would also like to flag the importance of um, having the local community's perspective, how they are affected, uh, what, a, what an internet shutdown actually means for people who, who experience it. Uh, I'm saying this because we worked a lot on the latest internet shutdown in Cameroon, which lasted uh, 94 days in Anglophone regions, and we, re we received a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of requests for help from communities who were affected. So um, I, I'm also looking forward to, to seeing more local voices being uh, brought in this discussion, global discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for coming back in on that topic. So I have Sheeta, and then apparently somebody remote, and Barack, and again, every, and Jennifer. Uh, please try and use the online queue, because that will help us manage it appropriately. But Sheeta, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so this is Sita Raksmi. Uh, I'm currently speaking as one of the focal points of uh, Indonesia Internet Governance Forum, uh, I will say IDIGF, uh, not as a MAC member. I would like to update the IDIGF. We are currently focused on strengthening the organizational aspect of IDIGF. We have developed an explanation about role and responsibility of multi-stakeholder advisory group of IDIGF, including its internal mechanism to ensure the implementation of the key uh, NRI's principles like transparency, accountability, uh, bottom-up, uh, multi-stakeholder and et cetera. Uh, the draft will be published in IDIGF website very shortly uh, to gather input from the public. The main objectives are to gather as much as possible input from the communities and to the non-usual suspects, yeah, not, non the, not the same people and the same crowd anymore, as well as to engage with wider communities in Indonesia on the role of IDIGF and what's in it for me for the IDIGF. We hope you got the feedback by July 3rd uh, and finalized one of two weeks after. The document will be used uh, as the basis of strengthening the IDIGF. Uh, and we might would like to also have this NRIs, uh, the IDIGF annual meetings in October. But I will update you more on that. Thank you. Thank you, Sheeta. The next in the queue is apparently there's somebody remotely who wants to speak. Yeah, we have uh, Henriette. I'm trying to connect her now to the audio. She was connected, but now she's not connected anymore. Okay, maybe you can just indicate when she comes back on, then we'll put her back in the queue. We'll thank do that, you. thank you. Thank you. Um, Barak, I think you were asking for the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, Barak Otieno uh, from the Kenya IGF, uh, representing the Kenya ICT Action Network. Uh, just to congratulate the uh, NRI focal point for the good work that they've been doing um, and I say that quoting um, one of um, our leaders uh, Alice whom you all know who last year in the Kenya IGF mentioned the fact that IGF has the most impact nationally or locally and increasingly we are seeing that by the many voices that are being brought <coughs> online so just to say that with the support we've received from the um, NRI focal point and the IGF secretariat, 
Uh, now the Kenya IGF has grown into a full week. Um, we'll actually have a full week of IGF activities, um, uh, ranging from a youth IGF, ranging from uh, a discussion on internet shutdowns, and culminating with uh, the Kenya IGF itself at the end of the week. Uh, we've also managed to bring on board new voices um, uh, just to respond to the cry in the community that the IGF is organized by a few people. And um, the first class we had last year for the Kenya School of Internet Governance Forum, of which I'm happy the MAG chair was one of the presenters, uh, forms the bulk of the current multi-stakeholder advisory group. And um, uh, it's interesting to see the new voices coming on board and carrying the mantle going forward. So in closing, I just want to say that there's need for us to support uh, the NRI, uh, and in particular, let's look at ways in which we can fund um, the IGF processes or initiatives that are not yet strong enough. Thank you. Thank you, Barack. Jennifer, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Jennifer Chung. I'm speaking on behalf of the Secretariat of the Asia Pacific Regional IGF. Um, I'd like to echo my fellow NRI colleagues to highlight the great work that our NRI focal point has been doing and gathering for and from all of our NRI colleagues, so thank you very much. Um, just a quick update on um, the APR IGF. So the eighth edition will be held this year, um, 26th to 29th, July in Bangkok. Our overarching theme is to in ensuring an inclusive and sustainable development in Asia Pacific, a regional agenda for internet governance. Um, we'll be having uh, six pre-event capacity building sessions, including fellowship and newcomer sessions, and youth IGF um, orientation sessions. So we'll also have, um, for the core conference, 35 sessions, which include um, four main sub-themes, the first of which is access, empowerment, and diversity. The second is cybersecurity, privacy, and safer internet. The third is digital economy and en enabling innovations, and the fourth is human rights online. Um, so a little bit about what we'll be innovating this year. Um, we'll be piloting also the Asia Pacific Legislators Roundtable on Internet Governance in conjunction with the annual forum. So this roundtable aims to be a forum that facilitates collaboration and knowledge sharing amongst legislators around the region, as well as act as a bridge between local legislators and the internet governance community. Um, so I wanted to highlight that a little bit and also um, mention that the NRIs itself um, there's a lot of very grassroots efforts coming from um, all of the NRI initiatives. So I think it's really heartening to see that you know the IGF MAG and also the IGF annual um, sessions do give a lot of importance and prominence to our work. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And is Henriette now with us? Yeah, we have uh, Henriette now. She's connected. Please take um, the floor. Hi. Thank you, Lynn. I hope you can hear me. Um, Firstly, I tried to take the floor on the, the BPF, so I'll just really quickly respond, if that's okay, um, particularly to Mark Carvel's point about the impact of the Best Practice Forum. So I'm from um, ABC, Association for Progressive Communications, and we are a, a global network of civil society. We do a lot of policy submissions at, at, at national and regional and global level. And Mark, we have found those best practice forums extremely helpful, particularly the one on gender and the one on connecting the next billion. We, we take content from there and we submit that to policy processes and the response has been really positive. And for those of you who are in Geneva this week, the, the um, report on the gender digital divide of the High Commission of Human Rights actually references the IGF Best Practice Forum on Gender extensively. So, so that's an example. And um, quickly, I'm um, sorry about this, Lynn, but just on NRIs, thanks, Anya, for a wonderful um, report. And to you and everyone who's been working with you for what you've done to support the NRIs. And just to share information, APC will be producing two publications this year on NRIs. The one is Global Information Society Watch, and, and we'll have a, a a publication that provides an independent view on various NRIs. 
but we're also producing a volume together with the IJ Secretariat where we hope to publish the toolkit and some of the stories of NRIs and also basic contact information about NRIs. So we'll be sharing more um, during the MAG meeting itself and I think once, um, once Anya and Asheng and I have had a chance to, to recover from the MAG meeting, we'll launch into preparing this volume. So we hope this will be ready in time for the IGF. Thanks. Thank you, Henriette. And I'm very glad you actually managed it, uh, managed to get in the, in the queue and speak. Um, next in the queue, we have Marilyn Cade. Marilyn, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. For the past two years, I've been very privileged to work with the Secretariat and with the NRIs in what has really turned into an NRI network. And the MAG is hearing um, a lot about this, but I want to just do a quick 30-second review that reminds everyone that initially the NRI coordinators did not have a title and they met informally at lunchtime doing the open consultation. That has significantly evolved and I, I take the floor just to commend the work that they themselves are doing. They made a commitment in, um, at the IGF in Brazil to work together. They called on the Secretariat for significant enhancements to the support resulting in a focal point. Um, something that people may not remember is that we used to send our email request related to the NRIs into the general purpose secretariat mailbox and we probably actually exploded it sometimes. But now we have a focal point and you've seen the progress with the significant growth. The, the work of the, of the NRIs themselves, and I appreciate that people are studying them and have, are going to have comments about their work, but I want to reinforce the importance of maintaining their independence and helping them strengthen the work nationally. So I just am going to offer, um, at Omar's request, his apologies for not being able to join us. There was a death in his uh, business community that has taken him away. But the Afghanistan IGF is perhaps an illustration to all of us of how unique the demands and issues are that some of our NRIs face. It is not considered uh, physically safe for many international travelers to go to certain countries. And yet the Afghanistan IGF created a fantastic multi-day event and did a number of unique things, as you have heard other NRIs are doing. So I hope that as you, as the MAG, look at uh, how the NRIs who are working together to um, create their own main session and also these consultative exchange sessions that you'll take into account how unique it is for them to be able to come and participate at the IGF, but how important it is for them to be able to go home and that is where they can help to affect the international internet public policy by strengthening the work at a national level and a sub-regional level and a regional level. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marilyn. A very good, good comments. We have three more people in the queue, but I mean, I'd, I'd like to just recognize um, certainly first the work the NRIs do themselves. Um, it's an awful lot of work, and I'm sure it's not your first priority when you get up in the morning. Um, so it's, it's incredible just the growth we've seen and the contributions you're making. Um, I want to recognize Marilyn for a lot of her effort in her past roles um, to support that. She's been, you know, a very vocal and very visible champion for the, for the NRIs and clearly um, supported Anya um, coming into the secretary in the focal point role, which has really been critical to, I think, a lot of the advancements we've made in particular over the last year or so. Um, so, you know, it, it takes a village or a global village or lots of teams. Um, I think we're doing really tremendous work with the NRIs. I just want to recognize everybody's um, effort there. Um, if I can move then to the queue, I have Julien, then um, Diana Gomez, Raquel Gatto, and we'll come to you, Christina. So, uh, Julien, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to highlight uh, also and you know, recognize the efforts uh, from the uh, focal point, Anja, and all the people involved in the NRI's um, uh, work. And um, 
uh, talking as a um, Colombian member of the, our local initiative, uh, I would like to highlight also uh, the efforts of the toolkit that was translated to uh, several languages, um, uh, recently to Spanish, and uh, we had uh, uh, almost immediate feedback about uh, having this document. Uh, so other regions in our country has been using it to um, start their own initiatives that will bring more stakeholders to the discussions and not only to be located, uh, in our case, uh, in our uh, main city in Bogota, but in other regions that uh, are uh, uh, eager to uh, participate. So that was my comment. Thank you. <coughs> Thank, thank you, Julian. Um, um, next in the queue, we have Raquel. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've asked the floor, uh, not in my MAG member capacity, but as a part of the program committee for the LACHF, the regional Latin American Caribbean uh, preparatory meeting. Um, it's just an update. Our meeting is confirmed for the uh, 2nd to the 4th of August in Panama. Uh, I also want to celebrate, uh, this is our 10th year for the LACIGF, one of the uh, first initiatives. Um, our um, agenda was set through um, uh, open consultations with the community. We have recurrent t topics uh, such as uh, digital economy, cybersecurity, human rights, and data protection. Uh, we also have topics which were selected to link with the global discussions, the IGF global discussions, such as the connecting uh, the next billion and the future of the internet. Uh, I also want to highlight we we have uh, new sessions that uh, were introduced in the couple of previous. Uh, previous years and um, they seem to be a good experience to share. Uh, the first one of them is also having a specific session for the national initiatives uh, to coordinate, to showcase what they are discussing and to find this place within the, the regional um, uh, initiative, the regional IGF. Also, we opened uh, a space for the local host, um, for a local host session, and so they can also showcase their internet governance issues and, and internet issues in general, uh, and the open mic. So this feedback is, was also important, and, and we are continuing uh, those initiatives. And um, I also want to um, uh, highlight the importance of the work done by Anya, the, the focal point. Uh, it's really, uh, we really appreciate that being close not only to the regional IGFs, but several of the national IGFs in Latin America. It really makes a difference on the ground. So thank you very much. Thank you, Raquel. I'm going to go next to Diana Gomez, who was in the queue earlier dropped out. She's number 11. Now that the queue is, is visible, everybody can see it. So I want to make sure that I'm simply doing that because she was number 11. and We're actually in the uh, 2021. Christina, I'm slotting you in the queue. But we will move to the uh, online system later. So Diana, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, my name is, uh, can you hear me? My name is Diana Gomez. I work in the Federal Telecommunications Institute. Uh, I have a comment general in, in the topics of the Internet Governance Forums that also involve the national and regional initiatives. As part of the Federal Telecommunications Institute, I want to highlight uh, our commi commitment and interest in the issues related to Internet governance and also to recognize the importance of these kind of forums based on the multi-stakeholder model um, uh, whose purpose is to discuss and promote the development of an open and secure internet. However, we would like to point out that one of the purposes of this type of forums is to create the spaces for discussion and debate of any issues related to internet governance, such as uh, infrastructure, networks, human rights, cybersecurity, and other topics. In this regard, uh, I would like to emphasize that the MAG and the initiatives, uh, the national and regional initiatives, should consider a balanced agenda, taking into account the no that none of the terms are more significant than others, uh, that when we evaluate the workshops, the main topics, uh, the best practice forums, uh, we it's necessary to understand that all topics are part of a structure 
that together will promote an open, secure, and inclusive internet. In this way, I believe that the forum uh, should take care that there is a real balance in the topics that will be discussed in order to give spaces to the different actors in an equal, equal footing. Uh, I noted that the, the last forum's issues related to human rights, freedom of expression, service security, have been given a higher priority, leaving aside more technical issues like IPv6, infrastructure, networks, um, deployment, and etc. I understand and share the importance of the topics like human rights. However, it is necessary also to consider that if we don't create spaces uh, to discuss more technical issues, uh, there will be no progress in many principles adopted in the Geneva Declarations as the paragraph 49, uh, where highlighted that the management of the internet encompasses both technical and public policies. Thank you. Sorry, I guess the mic wasn't on. Um, so what I have in the, in the queue is um, Christina, then we'll go to Shagun Lee, and then we'll go to you after Aida, because you weren't in the uh, Thank you, Chair. My name is Christina Lida from Egypt, and I'm, um, I'm sorry for not using the system. I'm receiving an SSL um, uh, handshake fail, so sorry for using the offline system. Um, so I've, um, since I'm taking the floor the first time today, I would like to start off by thanking the Switzerland for hosting the uh, 2017 IGF and wish us all another successful IGF this year. And I also want to acknowledge the work of the Secretary of Hard Work and the excellent analysis that we have uh, looked at today of the IGF workshop uh, proposals and gradings. And I think that this analysis opens up a lot of um, ideas on, um, on the interest in the IGF and how the topics are going, and we surely have to make use of that. So uh, when it comes to NRIs, I believe that NRIs have come um, a long way. Um, in that collaborative work, and uh, I think we've all been witnessing that, like Marlene was saying. And, um, and I think that at this stage, uh, it's fair to say that uh, their work, their collective work is maturing to an extent that it is actually providing opportunities uh, for the global IGF uh, to look uh, at how it can make use of that collective work. So, um, and, and how actually to integrate uh, effectively the work that, coming from, that is coming from the grassroots. So in the morning, we noted, um, I think um, there were many voices saying that there are uh, some stakeholder imbalance maybe uh, when it comes to workshop proposals. There are also specific focus on um, topics versus other topics. And I, I think it is worth that we uh, look at the collective knowledge of the NRIs and see how we can make and compare, make use and compare the knowledge that we have there to uh, the global agenda. And maybe look at how the balance of stakeholders in the different regions and nationals look and uh, the topics as well. Um, and this comparison can help us maybe identify where there are discrepancies or either where, where the grassroots is moving in a direction that is different from the global uh, community. And, and then we can reach out to NRIs to specifically address uh, those areas like to give an example, if we have a focus, for example, in a lot of areas on uh, issues of access, which is uh, becoming less on the global agenda, maybe we can reach out to NRIs to uh, get them uh, with those specific topics. So that's just a suggestion for the future. Thank you. No, th thank you, Christina. Um, Sigun, you have the floor. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Shagun Olugbele. I would like to speak as a member of the Nigeria Internet Governance Forum. Um, the Nigeria Internet Governance Forum is quite growing. And um, this year, we are going to have our forum between the period of the intent, uh, on the 10th of uh, Ju uh, July to 14. And uh, the Nigeria Internet Governance Forum is growing because uh, the stakeholders are requesting for more dialogue platform. And uh, somehow, they've taken Nigerian Internet Governance as a platform to address a lot of issues. Now, there's the current issues that is really turning the country apart. That has to do with the fake news. Uh, it is having impact on the political process and all that. Now, in order to respond to that, we are having four days for the first time for this uh, Internet Governance Forum in Nigeria. And now we now have two days focus on um, engaging in dialogue with um, law enforcement and securities. 
especially in balancing the issues of human rights and the emerging um, cyber you know, um, yeah, crime and issues and the fake news. And again, we are also, also focusing on the youth section, which is on a, a day. And that is to provide the opportunity for the youth to showcase uh, what they have to offer, especially on the internet uh, empowerment and uh, for job creations, and at the same time, how they can be tutored on the uh, internet governance policy dialogue issues. Then on the last day, which is the main, the main forum, and that has been um, designed for the policy makers. And this time, we have uh, lawmakers, we have the, even the stakeholders that have not been traditionally part of the process. They are now being, coming to be, be part of the process. And uh, it is my joy to announce that uh, at the subnational level, a state government, uh, which is referred to as the government of Cardinal State, is the one now co-hosting the Nigerian Internet uh, Governance Forum. So it shows that the stakeholders in Nigeria and begin to see internet governance as a place, especially that forum as a place to come to address issues that has to do with internet. Then um, now let me speak as a member of the MAG. Uh, first, I would like to appreciate uh, what the NRL has been doing. This is actually a very wonderful and a good job. And um, the, the Working Group on Communication and Heartrush, I think we have a whole lot to learn from the approach. But then, I would like to also say this, that there is a need for us to uh, work together, the NRL and the, uh, the Working Group on Communication and Heartrush, because uh, we've been seeing effort and how they are growing. And I want to emphasize this, that the, the future of the internet governance is, is anchored on the success of the uh, NIR. So I just want to see that uh, we work together toward achieving same goals, especially getting across toward, um, you know, in um, communicating the values of the internet, um, internet governance forum at the community within the, um, um, to, the um, to the stakeholders within the DAC community. So that's just what I want to say for now. Thank you. Thank you, Shigun. Very interesting comments on the Nigerian IGF. I have Lee Hebart in the queue, then Aida, and then I believe that'll take us to the top of the hour, which is our lunch uh, recess, and I think there are some other um, sessions occurring during that period as well. <coughs> Lee, you have Thank the you. floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hello, everybody. Uh, Lee Hebart from the Council of Europe uh, in Strasbourg, France. Many of you know me. Uh, we've been around for a very long time. Um, and we remain very supportive of the Internet Governance Forum, uh, even more so this year because it's very close to us. I mean, Strasbourg is just four hours drive uh, from Geneva, so I think we'll, we'll probably be even more supportive, have more uh, colleagues and experts to, to come and share, to contribute to your session. So it's a standing uh, open invitation, if you wish, uh, for us to bring more uh, expertise to, you, to your different sessions. Um, thank you to the Swiss authorities, of course, for hosting and to the Secretariat, very good work. Uh, it, I can, it's some great progress. It was a great presentation by Anya. Um, and I'd like to echo what you said, Lynn, about the NRIs. I think, personally speaking, being around for so long, um, this is really a, a people-centered internet governance approach which is coming through. Um, I think that's undeniable. For me, personally, it's one of the most successful things of the IGF. Um, and I think um, it's becoming a sort of a, a culture, its own culture. I mean, if you count up all the, the people in all those, IG, those NRIs across the world, there's a cultural shift in how we understand the internet. And I think that's very important to understand. When I was in last week in Tallinn for the, for the Eurodig, there were 650 registrations. There were an unprecedented number of BIPs. There was two presidents of, of countries, the president of Estonia, the president of Lithuania, the prime minister of Norway, and there were two Swedish ministers, more than ever before. I mean, I think there's, a, there's, there's an un, a greater understanding that, you know, it's a bottom-up process and we respect the multi-stakeholder dialogue. That's become more and more clear. So I think, um, you know, after 10 years of Eurodig, which is now, you know, a milestone for us, um, I think the NRIs or this culture that would, that's being developed needs to be celebrated more. Um, and I'm thinking of the opening cere ceremony. I don't mean to say you should bring all the 80... 87 NRIs to the opening ceremony, then it would be a never-ending opening ceremony. But I mean, I think this sh there should be some uh, reflection on how to bring together the, perhaps the VIPs and the people somehow. 
to try to create something else, um, you know, this, so that the, the let's have the top meets the bottom, and and we, we actually create this 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 culture of the top and the bottom looking at, looking and, and perhaps collaborating with each other. Now I, I know there's a question of time and, and, and formats and spaces, but nevertheless, it's worth thinking about. Um, I think I think really the stories of people in those in those NRIs needs to be said. So testimonies. Um, stories, maybe you know, video clips. I don't know. These are things which could be thought about for the legacy, for the history, because this is history in the making. And uh, I'd really like to see that culture come through, and to understand that we, you know, in some ways, without being too cliched, we are building a history regarding how we deal with the internet. Especially when more and more, let's say, leaders talk about global rules, digital rules, regulating the internet. It's not going away. Conventions. I think very much more we need to to, to present the culture and understanding of internet from the from the bottom up top down and vice versa. Thank you. Very good comments, Lee. And I've said you know, many similar things about the WSIS 1 and WSIS 2 process as well. I mean, certainly a culture and shared terminology, shared experiences after weeks and weeks and weeks of, of um, very lengthy meetings. Um, Aida, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> so I would just like to follow up uh, on Anya's presentation and especially mentioning CEDIC and focus on capacity building and other activities that are taking place throughout the year, which show to be important uh, for final outcome and success for national or in this case of CEDIC, sub-regional uh, IGF uh, at the end of the day. Uh, so this year we had two fellowships uh, where one, let's call it a more general one fellowship program was supported by ISOC and a youth fellowship, fellowship which was introduced for the first time this year uh, supported by ICANN. Um, colleagues from CEDIG Executive Committee and other volunteers worked so hard on setting up an interesting and vivid program uh, that would attract uh, youth uh, participants uh, first to apply and then to contribute uh, actively uh, during so uh, it was meant to raise awareness, obviously, and uh, to develop capacity uh, encouraging these um, young people in our region that usually do not have opportunity to go more further uh, than the region itself um, to, to be able to see how things um, work and where they can um, have a space to you know, share. Um, so fellowships, uh, either partly or fully funded, uh, really showed up to be extremely important for enabling individuals from the region to participate in such event and uh, some often for the first time, even though they are involved in IG related issues for years in their respective uh, countries and work. Uh, and then other thing that we do have um, for uh, now are a surveys. For example, this year we introduced before the meeting a IDN survey, uh, which whose um, results are presented at the meeting itself. Um, so the community uh, basically give us their feedback. Uh, and then uh, what Anya mentioned were uh, monthly summaries and monthly hubs uh, that are organized. Uh, regarding the monthly summary, uh, it is a CDIC, a Diplo Foundation and Geneva Internet Platform uh, initiative uh, that is uh, being done um, every month. And yes, last three days before publishing it uh, go really um, uh, really intense, but it is very uh, a unique thing uh, for people from the region to be able to um, have a um, resource to go to uh, and and check what is happening uh, both in a regional and um, global level. And then mon monthly hub, uh, which is organized in the framework of a monthly uh, Geneva Internet uh, platform um, briefings. Uh, so it takes place every last Tuesday uh, of a month. And uh, we actually can say that we keep records of more and more of having more and more people from the region attending those online because uh, usually online participation is something that is not um, like doesn't have the same perception as being somewhere in situ. Um, so we do hope for NRIs to keep growing, but not only uh, with the number of existing NRIs, uh, but also with engagement, capacity building, and other activities throughout the year on the both national and regional levels, which uh, would hopefully bring us for real uh, new voices and perspectives being raised on global level at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Aida. I want to thank Anya for a great presentation, and yes. there have been a number of comments in various chat rooms here, and you know, recognizing the presentation as well, because I think it did serve to really set a good platform for the subsequent comments. 
Um, and I also want to ask Anya if she wants to make any final comments. Just to thank you for all your questions and uh, for just briefing also the community about the good work. Uh, we will see, probably we're also working on a plan to maybe create a unique platform on the website. Not ju just of the NRIs, I think there's a lot of good work happening beside organizing the annual meetings, but just the community is not aware, and it's sometimes hard to click on 85 websites. But also, on the other hand, that there are many of the large international organizations that are more and more interested to see how the bottom-up process really works in practice. Uh, so I think the latest one was from the... Um, from WIPO, I think you had a contact from the LAC IGF and Asia Pacific regional IGFs. They would like to visit and see how the process works in place, the World Economic Forum. So those are, uh, th that's something that kind of uh, also made us thinking maybe we can just together, all together, think of an idea to facilitate this process and make it easier for the community just that we're all networked, engaged, and save time and do some good things in practice. So that's all. And thank you so much for great comments. Thank you, Anya. And thank you, everybody in the Secretariat who supports Anya in her role as well. Again, none of these roles are, are possible um, individually. Um, that actually brings us to the lunch break. I don't know if there are any sessions we're meant to announce at lunch this time. We will, um, we will come back at 3 o'clock. Um, we're going to start with an update from Avri on the Dynamic Coalitions. Um, Quite remarkably, for my experience, my meetings were on time <laughs> with the agenda, which is good news because, of course, the topics that we have in the afternoon are, are just as important as those from this morning. So thank you very much, and please do come back at the top of the hour so we can start on time. Thank you.